Good morning. I'll call the County Board of Commissioners to order on this date of August 14th, 2018. Please rise for the pledge. <coughs> Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So we're in a different room this morning uh, due to the fact that we have an election going on today in our commissioner room, so we're being recorded and the recording will be posted later for folks to view that. Otherwise, we're normally live streamed, but today is different. Um, <clears throat> you notice at the top of the um, agenda here, we have our uh, mission, supporting community through quality public service. Any adjustments to the agenda? Anybody want to pull anything? No? Okay, motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Support. All in favor? Aye. 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 At this time, we'll have public comment. Um, you will have five minutes, as you know. In the past, we've always allowed you the five minutes to speak. Is anybody other than Arvis? Do you have some comments? Yeah. Okay, the table there is for you. interesting that the budget um, for the home and garage um, came in at what it did at 1.5 million. Um, as I recall back when it was a line item in the budget, um, somebody said it was $800,000 to hold a spot and then it went to 1.2 as the actual budget and now it's at 1.5. And when I was talking about it before, um, when the bond was a possibility, I was told that if you delayed in getting that building, uh, getting the bond, it would be at least a 10% increase in cost as the year progressed. That was just kind of an, a, an established thing. Things always get more expensive. So now we're talking about a building that uh, came in at 1.5 in your bids, and if it goes up again, because it's going to be 2019, now we're looking at how much money? Um, my question is, um, what's really necessary? I've asked for a copy of the OSHA report, which is what I understand is driving the um, rebuild, and I would expect that fairly soon, um, to see what is the minimum required on that building. Um, if we're talking 1.5 now or 1.7, or when are we going to be stop spending money on a garage? When are you, when are, when are you gonna pull our, ourselves in here and make something that is what it's, what's needed instead of spending something, some money on an architecturally engineered building that is increasing in cost for what? So your opportunity to do that looks like it's primary. Um, I hope you'll use that to rethink that whole whole garage and do something that is more um, reflective of what the community needs, not what some engineer wants us to have. Uh, my second thought today was about the um, golf course. And as I read the paper and I'm um, looking at many of the options and things that were talked about, two things occur to me. One is, did anybody <coughs> explore why we lost three key people at one time? We know why the first one left. The other two followed suit. What's going on up there? That's fairly unusual to have three people resign all at one time. And then you're talking about one of the options being combining Superior National with Gunston Hills. Um, all I can see there happening is that you end up with a Gunston Hills piece that now the county owns, and now we're going to need to have somebody that we are going to employ to manage that. And that usually means then one employee gets a secretary, and secretary and employee get an office, and now we have a department. I, encourage you to stay out of that. That's not what this county needs to do is to get involved in more of these kinds of expensive endeavors. We're already in too many. And by the way, I do not mind paying my property taxes. I mind paying them for what? 
Thank you. <coughs> Moving on to the consent agenda. Anyone want to pull anything there? If not, a motion to approve. So moved. Support. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Well, our first item on the agenda is a presentation. And were we waiting for Pat on that? Yes, Madam Chair, we would wait for uh, Sheriff Elias before we start that. Okay. Um, <coughs> I could do... What's that? I just saw the Sheriff go by that door. Okay. okay. <laughs> if we wait a minute, he'll be okay. right here. Right here. Okay. Yeah. 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 Around just the bandy Just decided how to get in. <laughs> <laughs> So do you, were you going to start with the budget, or did you want to start with the, the study? Uh, well, we had, I think we had Eddie on there, too. Yep. Do you want to just get that out of it? Because Paul's waiting outside if you're willing to bring him in. That's fine if you want to. Okay. I'll go grab him. Okay. <coughs> I was mistaken. I'm sorry. He's not here yet. So. Oh. Go with the bus. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> um. Where would you like to start? In the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever your beginning is is fine. You you have the narratives and. It it did not get in. Oh. Do you have a copy of the narrative? I don't have, I can, I can make copies. Maybe. I'll, I'll make copies if you can start the first line. Is that for the master planning? No, you're this is for, for the <coughs> excuse me, this is for the Sheriff's Office budget. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, you're <coughs> and we get a routine for budget. Got this. Right, that's what he's going to, he's going to do. Yeah, yeah for copy. <coughs> <laughs> so you burnt the midnight candle working on that? No, actually I didn't want to burn one of those. Oh, okay. <laughs> so it's up to date and yes. ready for presentation. It's looking good, I take it. Nigeria. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Well, I only have, <coughs> excuse me, two capital requests in the budget for 2019. Everything else um, basically remains static across the line items from 2018 to 2019. Um, and actually, these are not increases to the budget because the money for these capital requests has already been allocated to the sheriff's uh, vehicle expense account and the 911 account. So the sheriff's car expense, we are going to enter, instead of buying cars ourselves, which we've done in the past, we purchase squads, we then outfit them ourselves, we, we do all of that work, and when the end of life for, for that squad car comes, we have it stripped, and then we sell them. So you will... Now it's all the way to the old guy. So 
through some research and um, talking with other sheriff's offices across the state. Is there an extra copy? I didn't know that. Is there a copy for you? Or no, we don't have one for her. <clears throat> is that this? Who is this copy intended for? Do you need a copy, Molly? I'll take a copy. Yeah. Sure. Maybe just grab it if you want. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Um, here we go. Here we go. And Stacy needs a copy. There's three there, so I'll two. Yeah. So you changed the ways of doing the fleet? Yes, we are. We are going to enter into a fleet management contract with Enterprise. They are, they are beginning their, their public safety fleet management uh, branch. Uh, several other sheriff's offices in the state have decided to go with them. And what they do is they procure the vehicles for you. They make sure that they're all fitted. They deliver them to you. And then they take these vehicles. What they do is that they buy back our vehicles in and then they sell them at auction, but we will get a much better price for our vehicles when they buy them back as opposed to us selling them ourselves. And I have some reservations about selling squad cars back to the public in Cook County <clears throat> just because that they are, they're, they're driven hard, you know, and, and I would feel awful if somebody was, was, was to get one of these squad cars and something happened, you know, like a tire fell off the floor or something like that. So, I would rather have them sold somewhere else and gone through by a, a professional company like Enterprise, you know, <clears throat> and detailed and made sure that they are really good. So that is the first capital request, and you'll see in the third paragraph that we will need to replace three squad cars next year. And that that price would be approximately $171,000, and that does not include. Um, outfitting of squad cars. That's just the price for the squad car. The outfitting of the squad cars is approximately another twelve to thirteen thousand dollars a piece for everything that we need in them now. So with the with um with Enterprise, I'm sorry. With Enterprise, we are going to get six brand new squad cars next year. Um, that price will be uh, Seventy-one thousand dollars for six square cars, and with, by, with outfitting them, we'll be about another seventy-two thousand dollars. That's twelve thousand dollars a piece for six square cars. For a total of one hundred and forty-three thousand dollars, that's what we will pay for Enterprise. If we were to buy the six, the six square cars on our own and have them outfitted on our own, and everything, that would that would that cost would be approximately two hundred and sixty-four thousand. So through Enterprise, we would save in the next four years $121,000 out of our share fleet budget. I sat down with, with Pat um, earlier this year before we bought the three new vehicles when we were talking about working with Enterprise for 2018 and because we already ordered the vehicles, it didn't make sense to do that this year. Um, and if you, if, you, if you look at it and you say it sounds too good to be true, why wouldn't we do this? Uh, the front end is very good for counties. It's very good for us in this. On the back end, three or four or five years into this, we end up paying about the same amount as we're projected to be paying. Um, so the, it's enterprise is, is, is making this appealing on the front end for counties. And on the back end, it gets us about to where we would be anyway with the size of fleet we have. So our costs are, are gonna grow up to where they currently are, but they'll stay there. So over the first three years, we will realize some significant savings, and then we'll be paying about the same amount as we are rotating through that stock. The, the good news is, is we, we do save the money in the first couple, three years of the, of the contract. And the better news is that we're always driving newer vehicles than we currently are. And, and, and I agree with Pat, the disposition of used uh, capital assets is always a questionable thing, especially in a small community, and it's really great that we're hands off in this deal the way, the way that works. So um, when I looked at the numbers, I said it's too good to be true, it can't work. We looked at it a little deeper, I said, okay, I see, I see where this makes sense for them. And they're incenting this on the front end largely because they're pushing into all, you've seen the materials, uh, 
uh, Association of Minnesota Counties has talked about Enterprise wanting to work with counties to get into fleet management. And uh, they're doing that as you know, front end loss leader to get the business and then they'll be at the point where they're, they're equalized and they're, and they're doing well. But um, it does make sense for us. Uh, we're doing it with law enforcement, <coughs> proposing with law enforcement first and we'll take a look at the rest of our uh, the, the carpool, the general county carpool, we'll take a look at that and then the highway department will take a look at that as, as a bunch. The, the only sticking point that we have is the, um, the service and repair and the maintenance of the vehicles requires the vehicles to go to a shop that's certified by them and the closest one is of course the loop. And uh, so we do have to iron that detail out uh, as to uh, how we're going to handle that. Any? Let's, yeah. But but this this does make sense. It saves us money in, in 19, it saves us money in 20, and, and then it equalizes to about what we would be playing, paying and we'll be driving newer, newer vehicles. And, and, and one of the big benefits of, of this fleet management, especially for, for a little Sandstrom, is he spends a lot of time making sure you're ordering vehicles, procuring vehicles, making sure that all the equipment is there to have them outfitted, running the cars back and forth to Duluth to have, because we go through a emergency automotive technologies now to outfit our squad cars, because they're, they are the uh, professional source for this area. Um, so it's, 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 this is going to save him a ton of time by doing this as well. Okay, we'll open it up for questions, comments. Commissioner Deschamps? I think it's a good idea. <coughs> Definitely be driving new vehicles, and I do like the uh, putting, putting the old ones on the street. <laughs> so, yeah. Commissioner Deschamps? Uh, so, the old, some of the old squads went into the search and rescue fleet, so what do we do with the search and rescue fleet? Those will be included. The search and rescue fleet will be included in this because we needed a minimum of 25 cars to enter in this contract. Okay. So at the sheriff's office, we have 17. Um, we included the, the uh, search and rescue vehicles as well as emergency management squad as well. Okay. So then that means now the search and rescue vehicles will actually be able to open the back door from the inside. That would be nice. Promises. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll be. Pulling the money out of the same allocated funding that we had before. Okay. And then, is there any opportunity to have a local repair center certified so that we don't have to drive to it? I know that's not under your wheelhouse, but it'd be nice to reach out to some of the local. Awesome. If they watch the video, just have a conversation. It, it, with them. It, it's absolutely an option, but it would be up to them right. to meet the conditions that enterprise. But has. I would like to get the information to them so they're sure. aware. And then. Um, I think that this will save on staff in areas that people don't realize. I mean, to do an auction, it takes Brady disappear. It takes Brady's staff to do all of that and the paperwork and everything else. So it'll be a savings. I mean, thank you for digging further down the line to know that this isn't a too good to be true offer that we save on the front end, but then it comes in on the back end, and it'll be nice to not have someone constantly monitoring the fleet to see where you are on mileage and age and repairs and service to see when it turns over. It'll be nice to have this set up. It'll be nice to do this for an entire fleet. So, and this is what we do as a small community. We don't have the 45 staff with individual expertise that can do We can manage this in a different way that's cost effective. So thank you, Jeff and Pat and whoever else was involved in researching this and figuring it out and uh, thank you for thinking of the search and rescue fleet. <clears throat> well I, I, I agree with what's been said by the others and uh, I know uh, you know our system with hundreds of buses and we're did the least, and we figured it out all different ways but I think the real advantage is we get updated equipment, safe equipment and we got to look at the service angle of it and, and time of it our staff, so I, I think that in and of itself is a, a real advantage. So thanks for your work on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good deal. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so it's lease versus own, is that the Correct. issue? Okay. So we're not actually purchasing. We will not own the vehicles. Yes and no. Okay. <laughs> okay. We, uh, 
course, of them own the vehicles, but it's a lease contract. So right. it's like, yes. I mean, it's semantics, probably. Yes, exactly. um, I don't know if there are any issues with both semantics. But, um, it seems like a very good deal. So my understanding, so the cost um, per vehicle will increase so dramatically, they'll make up the savings that we get right now. Is that sort of the no, what, 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 higher than what it is, is is when we begin turning over our squads that we own right now, we will get a much better price for them through Enterprise than we would if we, if we sold them at, at an auction. So that that is what's taking the, the, the front end price down. Okay. The, the discount That's on the, the front price. end is them taking our fleet and Got giving it. us credit against the purchase of the new ones. Okay. And by the time you get to the Got fourth it. year, we We've cycled all of ours through, and we've cycled into all of theirs, so then we're paying for the lease rate. Got it. So the, so the discount on the front end is the credit for the stuff that we've already bought and paid for. If that in the credit for sense. having sold them. Yep. Yeah, in the future. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, it seems, it makes a ton of sense to have the people who are in the car business doing cars and vehicles, rather than sheriff's departments and companies and et cetera. So it makes total sense to me. And I let them save a lot of money. And I also realize that it won't be forever. Yeah. But it's still, like you say, it saves um, staff time. It also saves a certain amount of um, burden, um, just head burden, um, worrying about vehicles. Um, so I, I, I like the whole thing. But I agree with Heidi on the, the commissioner, the clerk on the, um, the maintenance part. Um, it would be great if. But it would be nice to keep that local just for the, the wear and tear on the highway for our maintenance. But, um, how are we doing it? Are we doing it? Um, we're doing it in house now. The maintenance. <coughs> Depends on what, you know, but There's the, a lot of different. The, the regular maintenance, there. your oil changes, and the tires, and yeah. that's, that's, that's all done. Yeah. Um, if there's something that needs to be done larger, that, that you know, it's either under warranty or, or needs to be dealt with by a dealership, then we have to take it to whoever's Anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good to know. Thank you. So the amount of time that you would keep the car would be up to about four years, or does it go by yeah. miles? But it goes both. Oh. Yeah. You know, so, some some of our squads, um, <coughs> I mean, they can get. 100,000 miles and we'll put on them in, in, in two and a half years. Other squads, like, you know, like the search and rescue squads, you know, I don't know that they'll ever get 100,000 miles for them. You know, so mm -hmm. it's, it's both. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. <coughs> Any further questions? So the, the next the next capital request um, has to do with furniture in the dispatch area. Um, we've had the same furniture <coughs> before, well, since the place was built in 1997. And between 97 and now, we have become so reliant upon technology that we are running out of space, efficient space to put servers monitors. I mean, there's probably 20 monitors that, that the dispatchers have to use. There are two radio consoles up there. Um, it's getting to the point where there's just no more space to put anything up there. And it's not, <coughs> excuse me, it's not very ergonomically designed for the dispatchers who, you know, they sit there for 12 hours a day and, you know, it's <laughs> something better for them to you know, benefit them. Um, and in this capital request, I included the statute for the 911 calls because this is where the this, this is where the money would be coming from to pay for the statute. 911 funds are are funds that are deposited to the county from the state of Minnesota for 911 service on telephones. Each county gets a, a portion of, of these of these taxes for 911 from the telephone company or from the state of Minnesota. I'm sorry. So these funds can only be used for very specific things. Furniture and dispatches is one of those specific things. Um, 
Let's see. You know, we used it for buying the software for our new record management and jail management software. You know, but there, there, there's only certain things you can use this money for. This is one of them. So this is this would not be an addition, even though it's a capital request, it would not be an addition to the sheriff's office budget. If, if the money is sitting in the nine one one funds already, and it keeps, like I say, every year it gets deposited more. Now there are things that we do pay out of this this, this account. Um, <coughs> We pay 25%, I think, of, of Kyle Oberg's salary because he's, he's GIS, and we need the mapping, and we need, you know, he's, that's, that's tied into 911. That's not a lot of expense. Um, like I said, software, um, just furniture, and, and a few other things that we can, we can purchase out of these funds. Um, we've done some research, and for these types, these types of, these, these these desks, these units are uh, they're not they're not cheap. I guess would be the, the, the best way to put it. Um, we're probably looking somewhere between fifteen and twenty thousand dollars to to redo the uh, dispatch area. Right now, I believe when I looked this morning, I think we have approximately eighty-seven thousand dollars in the nine one one fund. <coughs> Questions or comments for this particular? I'm looking at. I'm looking at <laughs> um, So you don't have a specific amount set, or you're requesting we, we, a specific amount we, for shares. I, I put in twenty thousand dollars for the capital okay. request. Um, and we had the we had somebody come. Fund. We had a, a company come and look at it earlier in the spring. They gave us a quote of twelve thousand dollars for an incomplete project. We we liked so, so I thought it would be um, like I said. We don't have an exact number yet, but I would think that you know twenty thousand dollars would be. So my next question is because I know um, a lot of organizations are using standing desks mm -hmm. now, which yeah. changes the equipment and looking to the future and so forth and the health and well-being of our county and particularly dispatchers if they're spending that kind of time um, at their desk, 12 hours in a stretch, it's just to really look out for their health and well-being is really critical. Yeah. Um, we have one standing desk there already. This this is for the, I guess, the, the, we call it the dispatch two. It's for the second dispatcher. <coughs> and, 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 you know, so that's, it's kind of stuffed in the corner and everything's pretty tight in there. So that's the easy for this one. And you can fit all this equipment and um, you know we'll be looking at the world study so if changes were to be made for the law, to the law enforcement center which obviously we will in the future these whatever we invest in these desks and chairs for those staff you now could be easily translate into the new one, I hope okay. thank you thank you Commissioner uh, well I, I think it's a good move and been a lot of studies done where you have uh, you can have work issues with staff if you don't have proper equipment and and uh, they can be cumbersome and inconvenient and it's just it has a negative impact on productivity and stress so good move especially the economic thing. Mr. Duker. So this isn't going to jeopardize any other expenses over the 911 account? Okay. And then are we going to have a um, chair replacement schedule? Chair replacement schedule? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got my attention. <laughs> Not for us. All over. <laughs> we don't sit in these chairs as long as the dispatchers. I mean, it's we, we, 24 hours sense. a day, 365 yeah, days a year. Sense. We have replaced most of the chairs up front already. Okay. And, and if they're if they have problems with the chairs or, or problems with you know, their health because of a chair, uh, we will yeah, it's done immediately. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Commissioner Shaw. I think it's a good way to spend the money. I can imagine sitting there for twelve hours. <laughs> mm -hmm. Some days it goes really fast. Mm -hmm. Some days it goes real slow too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, we're good on that. Okay. 
Do we want a motion for this now, or do we wait until we get the full? No, we don't Madam Chair, we, we don't want a motion. This is no. just an overview of the okay. requests. Um, okay. We will be nothing but the, the entire budget in September, okay. so we don't want a line item. Okay, we won't do that today. Alrighty, and are you waiting for? Okay, we'll have to do it in the next meeting. Well, you're going to request a new chair. Well, <laughs> <laughs> no, I got another sinker. <laughs> <laughs> you dragged it up so much. <laughs> 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 the complex. Karma, man, it can be trouble. It's only once every other year. Hey, Eddie. Wow, welcome, Eddie. So this is Eddie. Edward when he's in trouble. <laughs> oh, I call him Edward more than Eddie. Just he's from Slovakia. Mm, really? Come a long way. Yeah. You know, so he went to. The instructor went to Slovakia on a Thursday, got back on a Saturday. I picked him up on a Tuesday. A week and a half later, we started training. Mm. So we didn't get to know each other very well before we started training. Mm -hmm. And we went 14 weeks, 14 weeks with a little bit of a break in between. Mm. Super humbling experience. You go from a 16-year veteran deputy to a rookie dog handler <laughs> to, the, to the second to the second oldest person in the class to to uh, spending more time with him than you do your regular family to, mm -hmm. but uh yeah this is Eddie mm -hmm. right no mm -hmm. and he's uh sit. Eddie is dual purpose what they call dual purpose he's narcotic certified and patrol certified which yeah. means he can track track people down he can track people find articles um, apprehension and handler protection with a few other things in, in between but uh, constant constant uh, work in progress we try and do some type of training thing every day he wants it and Eddie works for for no he does he works for a toy which is what he's trying to get right now <laughs> <laughs> that he's basically just a puppy. Yeah. yeah, he's so, so much puppy in him that this is what he wants right here. Leave it. Leave it. So this is, this is his reward. And everything he does is for this right here. He just drives him crazy. If we're playing, if we're just playing, playing, he uses a tennis ball. That's kind of exercise, but this one is kind of puts him in the drive. So everything he does, when we train everything he does, when he finds drugs, this is what he gets for finding them, or any uh, <clears throat> patrol type training we do, this is what he gets at the end. So he really, really, uh, really loves this. When we first started training, he's faster than I am, so yeah. You give him the toy, well, needless to say, my hand got in the way of the toy several times before we figured out that, uh... <laughs> <laughs> but you're healing. So there's no, uh, everything's praise, he praised everything, so you don't yell at him or get mad at him or, That's which right. is, uh, <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's interesting. a lot of patience, a lot of patience. Um, when we got to, when we got to pick him out, there were three, three dogs that came back some, from Slovakia. Uh, Ramsey County got one and Cold Springs got one. And so they bring all these dogs out and they do a little show for every dog. And then uh, Ramsey County got to pick first, and of course, there Ramsey County so big. They brought a team of people to pick their dog, mm -hmm. and then they picked one. And uh, then I was next, and I got to pick Eddie. And I picked Eddie because he was the only one when they brought out that he came to me first, and then went out. But Ramsey County, one of the Ramsey County guys wanted this dog because he is so social. He's not mm. not aggressive at all. He's just super friendly. No. Sit. 
He keeps us all in the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He loves to play. He loves to play. Mm -hmm. Right, don't you? So part of the part of the canine program is you know we, we spent money on, on the on Eddie and, and the training, but part of the canine program is when when Eddie uh, retires, he goes to live. With him. How many years of service do they did he get? Uh, it varies on their health. Yeah. How much he gets worked um, up here, obviously, he wouldn't be as hard on on him as a metro dog would be, say. So I would say eight to ten years, if health-wise, if he stays healthy. Oh. Would there be more seasons of harder work, like summer, with the amount of tourism here? Oh, or it all depends. It all depends. I mean, we've actually used Eddie. Well, we got back mid-June. We have used Eddie probably a dozen times on various things. We've done tracks with him. We've done some well, more drug sniffs than tracks, but we've actually done a track. He didn't find the person at the end of the track, but he found the drugs they left on the trail behind. So, oh. is that why you were tracking? Oh, uh, a person person took it off in the woods. Okay, but I mean it was a drug related. Oh, no, was it? it was unknown. Oh. We don't know why the person they, oh. they fled. Okay. Yeah, it was a clean. Oh, boy. So the added benefit of Eddie is that we get you for eight to ten more years. <laughs> there you go. Maybe we'll retire together. <laughs> Has he found drugs uh, in any significant uh, situation? You know, other, he mentioned he found some on a chase. And mm -hmm. Um, no, not not like huge quantities. If that's what you're saying. Yeah. Not yet. What is the kind of drugs can you sniff out? Seven. Opioids? He could do marijuana, cocaine, crack cocaine, heroin, black tar heroin, methamphetamine, ecstasy. Is that seven? Mm. <laughs> 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 you ask him. <laughs> <laughs> and then so with them, some other drugs, some synthetic synthetic drugs have some derivatives of them things, so okay. he could possibly alert to some of that other stuff as well. And you have Narcan specifically for yes. that you carry with you? Yes. And it has to be checked out the same way as your Narcan? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's a, a Narcan huge... for him, I don't understand. It's if he dog. sniffs out fentanyl and gets oh an overdose, gosh, he needs to be treated oh. also. Yeah. And he would get just like an adult dose, same, the same thing. You can't overdose on Narcan, so... Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. So that was part of the donation and the funding was to make oh. sure that the Eddie was covered. We, we were lucky enough to uh, be able to team up with some St. Louis County dogs and Carlton County dogs and some of the range dogs. So oh, once a month, we'll be able to go to Duluth and train with them guys uh, for a day, which is really good because not only you learn from uh, experienced handlers, but you get to be around other dogs and see how they work too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we've done that. We did it in July and we're going to do it next week now. But they try to get together every month. Thank you for stepping up and taking this on. It's a huge Sure, it's uh, mm -hmm. a lot more than I thought it would be. It's uh, I didn't realize how much training goes into one of these dogs. It's just amazing what they can do and <laughs> when you see them. What they need. Yeah. yeah. What they demand. But you know, he's he's so friendly. Yeah. And he he you know he lives at home with me. He's not he's not in a crate all day long at home. He interacts with the family. He mm -hmm. plays with my dogs. Really? Have your kids no. figured out that their friends can't uh, come over with any rose on them? Or <laughs> 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 Not that that happens. Mm -hmm. oh. Any questions about them? So, yeah. I haven't worked in the sheriff's department. My child is this primary purpose no, for Cook County um, no. like search and rescue, or is it drugs? I, I guess there isn't. Well, he's doing. There he's, isn't a primary pur purpose. No, there, he's, he's dual purpose when it's considered. Yeah. So he, he, he can't search like, say, a bloodhound can. It's got to be like a, a fresh scent track. So you couldn't, somebody couldn't be out in the woods for three days and expect him to find him. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would be okay. like, like, say, a little kid wandered off from home, and mm -hmm. we don't know where they, that would Six be. Six hours later. That would be like the type of thing he could do, you know, fairly within hours, not okay. days. Okay. Hmm. <clears throat> do you work for the Border Patrol then at all? As far as? If they have a reason to, you know, like go to the border. Yeah, they have. We, we were up there last week. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other comments?
comments, questions? Well, thanks so much yeah. for taking it on. Appreciate it. It's a, it's a lot of fun. I couldn't uh, couldn't imagine doing it now. This was actually when I got into law enforcement, one of the things I wanted to do. And uh, up here, I didn't think it would ever happen because it's such a small place. Mm -hmm. And then it did, so it was super exciting. Mm -hmm. And it came together fast when uh, when it finally did. But yeah, he's, he's a lot of fun. How's your shoulders feel? <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I actually kind of heard it when we were training because he, he can pull so hard, and if you're not paying attention, he'll yeah. jerk you. But yeah, you get, you get used to it. Mm -hmm. the Slovakia. Mm -hmm. Is that the place known for raising? Yeah, lots of lots or not of not raising, but um, lots of these lots of police yeah. canines come out of Europe. Actually, most of the all the dogs pretty much in Minnesota come out of Europe. Really? Yep. Is oh, no big breeder in the United States? No. Oh, wow. No. Europe has the probably, and it goes back to World War II. They taught us, yep. like, they told us about the history of it. And it goes back to World War II. The, the proven working bloodlines are just phenomenal over there. Interesting. Then we just strike by our next culture. So there are mixed, <laughs> these mixed then, oh. you imagine, mm -hmm. or any of, the, any of the dogs that come over are probably fixed? No, they're they not. They're not fixed when they get here. We had him fixed in between the two classes, and uh, they don't. They don't have to be. It doesn't change how they work or, or uh, their drive. But uh, for cancer reasons, they have a lower risk of cancer if they get fixed. So that's why we opted to do that. Okay. Well, thank you for coming. Thanks for bringing them in. <laughs> 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 chance to meet with the board in the past at a work session to kind of go through our progress of the study and so we've spent some time since then uh, just kind of going through the final projection numbers <clears throat> uh, figuring out some of the operating uh, pieces of it so that we could put together a complete report so that we give the board an opportunity to kind of look at uh, kind of next steps for uh, the law enforcement center and for some of the other things that we've looked at through that uh, so today I just want to do a quick review of kind of our guiding principles and kind of the project goals, talk a little bit about uh, process as far as how we determine need, and then uh, talk about the, some of the models that we use to look at um, the population projections for the jail, and then what uh, recommendations we have as well as kind of what budgets we should be expecting for any sort of changes to the uh, jail and law enforcement center. Um, just as a reminder for the board on the next page is what our project goals were. So certainly uh, foremost on there was kind of assess our future space needs for law enforcement and for the uh, jail. Uh, inventory the, and evaluate the existing facilities uh, and kind of confirm its ability to be expanded. Uh, determine our jail population projections. Uh, from those projections, make a recommendation on jail bed and staffing needs in there. Uh, look at some concepts and options for uh, the future and then providing some recommendations for maintenance um, and I'll talk a little bit about that as we look at our solution for the facility. Um, we did uh, develop some guiding principles that uh, kind of revolve around those same ideas which are improvement should be driven by the commitment of the county for, to provide better service to the public. So as we look at our solutions, 
uh, certainly uh, fiscal responsibility uh, as a board uh, and looking at uh, the, the most effective and efficient way of doing that. Provide adequate facilities located in the county to meet the long-term needs for the community. Plan for both uh, current and future needs uh, with flexible space for changing programs. Uh, mitigate public and staff uh, safety and risk. Modernize our aging infrastructure and utilize technology to support staff and customers. So how did we go about figuring out our recommendations? Well, there's a number of ways that you can put together population projections for the jail. And so we didn't want to focus specifically on just one. We wanted to look at a number of things and then see if we could draw some conclusions between some of the different factors that go into a jail population. Uh, some of those that we looked at, the most simple one is just looking at your average daily population over time to see what changes might, uh, um, what we might be able to predict by looking at that. But another thing we wanted to look at was district uh, court filings. Um, so we looked at uh, what our court people, our court folks are doing. Uh, we looked at uh, our bookings for the jail to see if we could correlate any sort of changes with that. We looked at inmate days served, average length of stay, and then we even looked at arrest data, not only for locally, but also for the state. Some of the things that, uh, in order to look at that data, we needed to kind of figure out what are our assumptions. Uh, what we discovered was that we probably wanted to focus on some of the more recent um, jail data. Um, as you go back further in history, some of that data is suspect, and I'll highlight a few of those as we go through that. We did look at uh, jail data from 2006 to 2017. Uh, we had some numbers in there prior to that and some of our other um, projections, but uh, we really wanted to focus on uh, that 2006 to 2017. I'll explain a little bit about this as we go through, but we developed a, an average incarceration rate for each model. So you basically take those statistics and figure out what our, uh, the ratio is based on what the model is and that'll kind of give you an idea as far as how we would project into the future and then uh, we wanted to make sure that we included a, an additional 15 percent for a jail management factor which really means it gives you flexibility in the jail so you're not at 100 percent occupancy so you have flexibility on classification and housing of different uh, inmates within the system and it's a recommendation by the department of corrections that's pretty standard it varies usually between 10 and 15 percent so one of the first things that we wanted to look at that we didn't really do a, a projection on, but county population sometimes is an indicator. Uh, we sometimes get erroneous data if there's decreases in population, but uh, what we found is, is that uh, county population projections, uh, the county is growing, but it's growing at a slow rate. Uh, but the, the adjustment in the graph that you have in front of you really is the 2010 census data. So the, the numbers between 2000 and 2010 are um, the previous you know, census, I mean the previous census numbers and um, what those projections were at that time, 2010 census did a, cor a correction at that point in time and then the, the numbers moving forward are the, the numbers that we have and then what the uh, um, state demographer's office is projecting for Cook County. Uh, as we get into uh, our jail projections itself, the, we, the first one we looked at was average daily population. And so we do have information from when the jail was opened. It opened in 2001 with a, with a whopping total of a 0 0.06 average daily population. So it was a, obviously a, a, where the jail started. And things stayed pretty consistent as far as growth. You know, up to 2005 it was when it was the last year that the county didn't board uh, inmates out of the county. And 2006 is the first of data that we have that has population that was boarded elsewhere. So we have a male population of about 2.06 and a female population of about 0.61 that was uh, out of the county at that point in time. And so you see a bit of a jump in the numbers at that point. And what we're suspecting is, is that, um, that the way that the Department of Correction tracks data changed at some point in time uh, in that area. And when I was talking to Ben about it, our suspicion is, is that that's just the, the way that the numbers have changed and were tracked at that particular point in time. Uh, and the numbers kind of went up and then they go down slightly and then they jump up again. And so what we're suspecting is that's just a, a natural trend in the numbers. And so as you go to uh, kind of the next page, it's just a graph of that. And you can see that there's a, there's a, a very specific peak and valley, peak and valley type of thing. So we believe at this point in time we're in that low spot. 
and projections. And as you look at that uh, trend line in there, it's still, even though there's ups and downs in there, it still tends to trend uh, upward over time. Um, so the other thing, that the next one that we looked at was uh, bookings. And we see a kind of a similar trend. There's not a lot of information up until we get to 2006. And the numbers from 2006 um, were fairly steady for a couple of years, and they dropped down, and then they jumped back up again. So it's kind of similar to that average daily population that we had talked about. Uh, but there's been a steady increase in numbers from 2012 to 2017. Um, and that graph is, is, has a similar thing. The trend line is a little bit lower than our projection line in there, but reasonably about the same. So that trend is going to continue up in the bookings arena as well. Uh, we also looked at arrest data, not only for the county, but statewide. Uh, interestingly enough, there's been a steady decrease statewide in um, the arrest data, especially and also in this particular district as well. Uh, the arrest data for Cook County mostly followed the state and local trends with the exception of 2015 and 16. Uh, Cook County was actually up, whereas you know the statewide projections were down. Not exactly sure what that is. Just could have been a local uh, blip as far as you know um, different types of, of uh, crime that was reported at that particular time. Uh, we did use some of the most recent data for our projections. Uh, and the graph would to show you what our projections are indicating. Um, by 2040, we have a average, we have a population of around 19 for the jail. Uh, looking at uh, court filings was the next projection that we looked at. So from uh, 2006 to 2011, there was a decrease in court filing. There was a slight increase in 2012, but a steady decline uh, uh, during that time. Uh, there appears to be an increase in the number of probate and mental health cases, which isn't probably surprising as you look at how uh, those uh, cases are being um, uh, looked at these days. Um, and we're really kind of focusing on some of the more uh, recent um, information that we have. Uh, so if you look at court filings, the trend line, and our projection numbers that are following along fairly closely with uh, a uh, the jail population of about 24 in the year 2040. Our average length of stay was the next one that we looked at. Sorry, right, there's a lot of data here. If you look at the whole report, there's even more, but I tried to keep it a little bit more summarized in here. Um, the 2006 data, I'm suspecting there's an error in reporting. It would be kind of odd that it would go from uh, a 9.5 average length of stay to 20.45, and so we kind of excluded that from the data. Uh, there's been a steady increase in the average length of stay from 2007 to 2015, um, and then there's been a drop in recent years. Uh, there's no real information as to why. I have some suspicions that it could be related to diversionary programs that are out there, whether it's circle sentencing or, or changes in probation rules and stuff like that to change your average length of stay. So it could be some, some of those uh, more recent trends that are impacting our average length of stay. Um, and similarly, the graph kind of follows along those same lines. And then we also looked at inmate days served, which um, we believe that there's that same error in 2006. And similarly, there's a, a decrease in recent years, and it's, it likely follows along those, that same trend of diversionary type programs, alternative types of sentencings, and uh, possibly some changes in uh, probation and those types of things. Um, and then again, our graph kind of follows along with our trend line in there as well. So what we did was we took all of that information, talked to the core planning group and the sheriff's department, and determined that the, our best course of action was to look at the average between all of those models, not sp focus specifically on a particular uh, solution, a, a particular projection in there. And when you look at all the numbers combined, it would tend to suggest that we're looking at a jail population of around 24 in the year 2040 uh, with a, a max of, of 30 in 2050. And those numbers do include that 15% management factor that we were talking about uh, earlier on. And so then we, just to kind of give a graphic as to why we believe that the average is probably the best way to go is that if you look at the next graph, it really shows you that we have a couple of projections that are above the line and a couple of projections that are below that line. We think it's probably prudent to uh, stay somewhere in the middle. 
and really focus on a jail solution that gives the county flexibility in how you populate the jail. And so one of the things that we know about jails is, is that um, it's hard to build those spaces um, and add on. So we want to look at a number that seems reasonable based on what we think the population is going to be and then build in flexibility in the jail on how you um, occupy those housing units. And so one of the things that we can do is you can um, double bunk the, you know, the jail in certain, to a certain percentage of it. So you could start out with a lower amount of, of beds within the facility, but have the capacity in your program spaces and your day room spaces to allow you to increase the capacity without increasing the size of the jail. So we really kind of focused on that when we were looking at the size of the jail. So if you go to the next uh, slide there, what we did was we took a look at the existing jail and, and what was in there as part of that kind of facility assessment. What you currently have in the jails, you have a, a reasonably sized uh, booking area. There are some deficiencies in the booking area related to property storage and kind of inmate processing that we would want to look at increasing the size of that area. The Sally Port is undersized for uh, the building as a whole. Uh, I think it was undersized when the building was built, to be honest. Um, so we would want to right size some of those intake and processing areas if we're looking at an expanded program for the jail. Uh, the housing units actually work pretty well. The day rooms that are there are, are uh, uh, sized appropriately for the types of activities that are going on in those areas. So we don't really see any changes in those two existing housing units. Uh, the work release area is actually oversized for what you currently would need for a work release area so we can right size that area. Uh, but one of the things that we would have to change in a full-time jail facility is the visiting area in there. And so we would want to increase the size of that. And so what that envisions is um, a, what's considered a video visiting program in there. So it, re it reduces the, and at times eliminates the need to move uh, in custody uh, persons from the housing unit to an area where they would uh, have the visiting occur. And so you would you would add uh, video monitors in uh, housing units and then uh, somebody that's coming to visit with somebody would be in a remote location that um, would have a, another monitor in there. So that way it, it increases our safety and security in the jail and it allows us to, the Sheriff's Department a lot of flexibility in how they uh, manage that program and what types of hours that are available for them. Um, the next section in that program is what we would need to add to the jail in order to meet those capacity requirements and some of the things that are required by the Department of Corrections to operate a full-time jail facility. So what we are proposing is to uh, add 14 new cells in a new housing area that would be a combination of single and double bunked uh, units there. So you would have a total capacity in the new unit of about 23 inmates, which obviously you could go from zero to 23, there'd be 14 cells in there. So it gives you a lot of flexibility in how you occupy those spaces. The multi-purpose room, that is a requirement by the Department of Corrections based on the size of your jail. So a jail that has 28 to 30 inmates, a 500 square foot multi-purpose room is what's required by the Department of Corrections. Uh, we would have to have some amount of kitchen facilities. Doesn't mean that we're cooking in the jail. It just this, this says we have to have space there for food service to occur in a full-time jail. Most uh, counties contract that service, but it still needs to have the capability of serving meals from that location. Uh, we do need to provide some level of, of medical services in the jail. Uh, that could simply be an office and a storage room for meds that you know a, a county health nurse could go there is a the way a lot of counties uh, deal with uh, medications within a jail facility. And then we need an ancillary program room to, to meet our Department of Corrections uh, standards on that. So the total size, net size of the jail would be about 9,900 square feet, so roughly 10,000 square feet of, of net space needed to operate a full-time jail facility in comparison to the roughly 4,000 square feet that you currently have in the facility right now. Uh, not to, um, to, to talk, look in totality of the whole jail, uh, we know that there are some deficiencies in the Sheriff's Department in the um, in the deputies area, in their squad room. Uh, the current emergency operations center is also a conference room and also a break room. 
Uh, so we did look at some of the space deficiencies within the current law enforcement center and put together a revised uh, recommendation as far as how that facility should be expanded and changed, uh, which gives us, with the expanded jail in there, gives us a total size for the jail need of about 18,400 square feet. So one of the things that we had, had spent some time on during the study was uh, what does this mean for staffing? Because that's the largest component for a county to take on, a sheriff's department to take on in a full-time facility is those full-time jail staff that need to be there in order to run the facility. Uh, ben did a great job of talking to other counties on how they would operate a jail of similar size, came up with the numbers that are here. Uh, we would want to spend a little bit more time with the Department of Corrections just to make sure that that staffing plan is approved, but this is a good benchmark as to where we would need to be. So currently there are seven, uh, with the supervisor, there are seven uh, dispatcher jailers in there. We would still continue with that same model where our, our jailers would also be our dispatchers. Um, you're not of a size that you would necessarily need to split that, um, that position up. But we would need for a, a jail that is between 25 and 30 beds, we would need roughly about 10 and a half persons for that. Uh, as you move towards a full-time jail facility, there is a requirement for some programming. So one of those officers would, would also serve as a jail programmer, which would deal with uh, some of the services that you bring into the jail, whether that's um, religious programs, whether that's therapy programs, those types of things that occur within a jail those are handled by the programming staff. And so you don't really have a need for a full-time person at, the, at, at that point in time, but you would need to provide some level of service for that. So looking at adding, you know, roughly about four staff, you know, to, you know and again, it isn't, you don't start from eight and go right to 12. It's kind of a timeline of, of as you grow, these positions would have to be added on to. Uh, so you get to a certain level of, of per person's in custody and then you have to add additional jail staff and then you have to add some of these other pieces to it as well. So we tried to take that into account as we were looking at um, kind of projections of cost. Uh, so I spent some time with the county administrator, with uh, Brady and with uh, the sheriff to kind of talk about what do we have going on today as far as current costs for operating the jail. And so this is just staff costs and transportation and boarding costs. So these are the officers that are traveling to other facilities. This is the, um, the uh, uh, boarding cost for being in those facilities. But this doesn't take into consideration as wear and tear on those vehicles. So as you heard the earlier presentation, um, this is, incurs a lot of mileage on vehicles transporting folks back and forth. Uh, the numbers that uh, we got for 2019 in the budget is roughly a budget of uh, $428,000 uh, for uh, staff and um, for the for the jail, and that in includes all of those six um, jailer dispatchers that we have. Uh, uh, we have a rough projection of about $140,000 for transport and boarding costs. Uh, gives us a total of about $570,000 total between our staff and our transportation. Um, I used. Um, Kind of market adjustment, uh, consumer price index, and inflation to kind of come up with how we would project future costs for jailers and for that type of stuff. And so it's roughly about a 3% increase annually for staff costs. So that would be roughly about $73,500 for staff in 2020. Uh, and then a slight increase in transportation, which puts us at about $550,000 uh, in 2020. And based on our conversations as far as when you could potentially uh, staff a full-time jail facility would be 2021. So that would be when I would see your transportation and boarding costs go away. So then you would just be keeping that money in the county. So there's a slight decrease in, in cost. And so it's about cash neutral at that point in time. But obviously as you add staff and inflation and all of that type of stuff, those costs will go up over the years uh, as you add staff uh, to the jail. So, um, so there's a lot of assumptions in here related to uh, inflation, related to consumer price index, and some of those types of things. So, kind of our best shot at how, you know how uh, money increases over time. Uh, one of the things that we did want to do is give you a comparison as if the board decides to do nothing and let's continue to transport and board folks uh, out of the county. 
At some point in time, obviously, as those jail population projections increase, your transportation and boarding costs are going to increase as well. And so this is intended to give you an idea as far as what are we currently averaging per inmate for both our transportation costs and our boarding costs and what those totals are. So the average of the years that I had data on suggests that per inmate, you're spending roughly about $2,500 per inmate uh, for transportation. Uh, you're averaging about uh, $143,000 for boarding of those uh, prisoners over the years. Um, and then I just out of curiosity, I wanted to see how much it was costing per bed so that I could kind of compare it to what I've heard others are boarding prisoners for. So it's roughly about $50 a night for boarding, which is about average for what I what I understand facilities are renting out these days. It usually is between $50 and $60 a night for boarding costs in another county's facility. So then I took those numbers and, and projected them over time, utilizing those, those numbers and then just adding those same inflationary numbers to it. And as your average daily population for the jail, for just the boarded part of it, because you have a certain level of capacity in your current jail, and so, the, uh, so I just looked at the numbers that would be boarded out of the county, uh, and those were between 9 and up to 22 as you go over time, as you look at that uh, uh, suggested graph that we have there. So. Those numbers will be similar to the staffing number, slightly higher. I think it will cost you more to board out over time if you look at it um, as to what those costs are going to continue to increase for boarding inmates out of the county. Um, so with that, uh, I think we had talked recommendations to the county board at our last uh, work session about could we expand the current facility. And so that's been our kind of main focus is um, on the existing site. And it's not to say that this is the only option that's out there. This is just the one that we landed upon as a way to figure out what our, our entry point for cost would be. Um, certainly, you know, it's, it wouldn't be um, out of line to build a new jail and law enforcement center if there was an ability to, um, uh, to get a, to sell this facility. But we didn't focus on that at this point in time. We just looked at could we expand onto it. We know that the jail uh, could be bigger going to the north. It's, it was designed uh, originally to be bigger in that direction if you look at some of the old drawings of the jail. so. An expansion of our law enforcement center for additional uh, squad and office space and, and our emergency operations uh, would work on the north side. And then we would expand the jail towards the, um, the garage that's there for our search and rescue vehicles. So there's a little bit of a hill that goes up. We would try to avoid or we would re have to relocate the antenna. The antenna is that little white spot that's just, or that little square that's just to the north for those that don't have a colored copy of where we're proposing the jail to expand. And so again, we're not designing it right now. That would be in the kind of the next phase of this would be to figure out exactly how it would look there. But that the little block that we have there is roughly 7,200 square feet, which is about how much we would need to add to the existing jail to make that work. Um, we did spend some time looking at a historical cost per square foot for jail facilities. So the next page has some historical data of various jails that have been built uh, in the state of Minnesota and then elsewhere. And so the numbers range on the low side of $335 a square foot to on the high side of about $485 a square foot. So we're certainly not suggesting that for this facility. We did land upon uh, $375 a square foot as our recommended unit cost for uh, for the jail, which assumes you know a, uh, a slight increase in for inflation over time. And so again, depending upon when the board would want to go forward with something like this, there's some inflationary numbers that are going to come into play as well. But we did look at uh, construction in 2020. So anytime after 2020, you would have to make some adjustments to some of the numbers. But that $375 a square foot for the jail edition, about $275 a square foot for office edition, some deferred maintenance work. So, you know, over and above uh, doing work in the building, we would have to do some other things. The windows are getting done this year, but there's mechanical work and some of those types of things that we would want to do as long as you were doing that renovation work in there. 
And so we have roughly a, a total construction cost of a little under 3.7 million. Project costs are 30% of your construction cost gives you a total project cost of right around $4.8 million to do an addition and renovation to the jail. So a pretty modest uh, addition uh, and fairly conservative based on what uh, we were looking at there. So kind of next steps is certainly is to adopt the report and the findings and recommendations. Um, I know that your county administrators has some thoughts related to financing and kind of schedule pieces of that. Um, and then certainly to get to a level of detail for the board to feel comfortable with the budget, we would probably want to start a design process to uh, develop that solution to a higher level of detail, get the Department of Corrections involved uh, with the solution, uh, and make sure that um, we have a complete uh, design to get uh, reason to get uh, our uh, numbers to be a little bit more more accurate. So, with that, I would send it back to the chair and see if there is any questions or anything that we can go back to and explain more. There's a lot of detail here. I know there is a roughly 50 to 60 page report that I shared with the administrator that for those that want to read through all of that data, uh, I don't know if you've distributed at this point in time, but uh, that would certainly be something to take a look at. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. It's a good start to Thank you. thinking about Thank you. our future with uh, law enforcement. So we'll open it up for questions, um, starting with Commissioner Deshaun. Well, what do you think, Pat? <laughs> wow! <laughs> what do you think? Well, um, that's a good one. <laughs> Obviously, I mean, running up and down the road, it's, it's not good for my staff, it's not good for the, for the inmates. Um, having inmates here gives them a better chance for programming, some you know, religious programs or, or chemical dependency or alcohol dependency programs as well as, uh, you know, re-entry programs as well, you know, when, when, when they are released. You know, you know, if, if you can, if you can uh, work, work with them, have counselors work with them, and upon re-entry, you know, they're, they're, they're looking for a trade or maybe have started, uh, you know, uh, learning some type of trade while they were, they were incarcerated. So there's that aspect. There's also the aspect of uh, visitation and recidivism. When you can have inmates, you know, when, when they can have contact with family and friends, you know, that's that's, that's very big on not only their their mood and their well-being while they're in jail, but you know, there's there's some aspect of accountability when they're released then as well. So I, you know, I, I'm obviously in favor of it because of all the all of the positive things it can do. I I, I realize it's a lot of money, and um, you know, <clears throat> I don't know that it's you know that where we're going to make money by having a jail. You know, I, I don't think that's our intention here. I think our intention is, is to provide um, better programming, better space for staff and inmates. Uh, do you see if we have these 10 to 15 inmates here, projected inmates, that is there any chance that the sentence to serve program could be going again and get these inmates working within the community where they're needed? There's, there's always that chance, you know, that's largely dependent upon the offense and, you know, what, what, what the sentencing is. Um, but it's, it's, it's always a chance we can get that better incorporated, absolutely. Yeah, I'd like to see that going again, because I know the recycling center is looking for people mm -hmm. and, you know, just all throughout sure. the community here, like Ollie. Mm -hmm. I think you all know who I feel I've been pushing this since. I got elected that this needs to be done. And when we go to our association in Minnesota counties, we've all heard numerous times that there is a lack of facilities for inmates and a lack of place to put them. And um, <clears throat> we've all heard our sheriff tell us that he doesn't like bringing some of our citizens down to Duluth for detox and drop them off and not know what happens to them. We actually have a sheriff who cares about his community members and wants to see the better of them. He doesn't want to see them incarcerated again. Um, looking at the numbers for what it'll cost for staffing and what it will cost for us continue to transport out of the community, 
we've got 150 to 200 thousand dollar minimum savings in there, and hopefully that will cover the cost of building the facility and paying for the loan, and you know to hope to break even. We've talked about for years the amount of money that we spend, and the other thing we don't think about is that um, besides adding the kitchen, when we feed our inmates, we are supporting local businesses doing that, and so we. When we have them housed somewhere else, we're supporting someone else's food service, we're supporting someone else's pharmacy, we're supporting someone else's medical facilities, and so it would be nice to keep that here and to keep the contingency. If you have someone here that's receiving help at our clinic, receiving medication from our pharmacy when they are out of holding, all of that continues without huge changes, without that burden of them having to do everything themselves, which just makes it easier for them to re-enter into the community. So uh, there's a lot of positives that come out of this. And I'm glad, Pat, that you've taken the step to work on this and to look into it and to ask the board to support you on this, because it's not an easy thing to do. It's not a popular thing with the community. The community sometimes just sees us as wanting to spend more money and build bigger, and that's not what this is about. This is about so much more, so thank you. Well, uh, I'd like to thank uh, our staff and uh, your your work uh, from your staff and you, uh, John. Um, it seems like you've produced a very good product for us to take a look at, and I think you've covered all of the you know kinds of issues and angles and and criteria that we need to look at. And I have a tendency to think that we should take care of our own uh, and um, there's a lot of reasons for that and I also have a tendency to look long term and if we were to continue the way we are we, it's just going to be more and more problematic and so I think from the long term this is going to be quite frankly uh, more cost effective for the kind of results that we can get from it so it's not just about spending money but spending money wisely and having you know some effect and so uh, good work, and I, I, I really like, uh, from my perspective at least, uh, in working on buildings and so forth, that you took sort of a midline approach in, in looking at what we could do, uh, not to skimp a lot, but also not to go that. And I think just looking at the facility and putting it where it's at, it's, it's, it's a good move. I, I did take a tour with you and the others, and served on this committee for a while there and uh, I think we vetted this uh, pretty well and um, I know that it's still a possibility that maybe the Border Patrol or Homeland Security would want to look at the facility but they would have to come up with a very good price. And, and I do appreciate I think the model also that we're not going to build to take in money, we're going to just size this to take care of our future. And, be cost effective in that whole process. So, thank you. Thank you, Pat. I have a question for Pat. There's some comments um, that I've heard is that now that we have a bigger facility, we would be bringing transports up here. Would that be ever in the future? There's, there's, there's always that possibility. I mean, there's, there's a, a, a you know, significant lack of, of housing and jail space in the Eastern Minnesota. I mean, that's, that's why we're bringing our inmates down here. You know, if we had extra beds and there's a possibility of doing that, we, we could take in other mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I really appreciate the gathering of the data. It's really helpful for that first step. Um, and I accept this report. It's, um, it seems excellent as a first step. I have a lot of questions about the next step, and I would really like to know if I was going to be making this decision, I would want to get some narrative, like from um, our current judge, et cetera, about law enforcement strategies for the future. And, because it feels like with restorative justice, there's going to be a lot of things happening that um, hopefully will change um, the need for jails in the future. That um, And to look at that approach along with jails. Obviously, the jails community will always be with us. Um, but I love the idea of a strategy to invest in people while they're here in jail or wherever they are in jail that would, that would prevent <coughs> recidivism that you talked about, um, Sheriff. 
Um, and that piece would be really important for me to know too, is how much recidivism is there in our numbers currently? Um, what is that percentage? Because um, to me that makes a huge difference when we're talking about building a new jail. Um, um, and the cost comparison, I, ha I haven't quite wrapped my head around that. I don't think that's really in this report. At least I didn't see it. Did I miss something? But um, so, um, Commissioner DeKirk, when you talk about the 150, 200,000 being taken care of by the building costs, that seems like not possible. But is that. Does that seem like a possibility? That when I look at jail data projections and operating costs on this page, and yeah. then look at what it costs to house outside and what it costs for us to add staffing and house locally, I was looking at those two numbers. Yeah. Because we have to pay for the building, plus we have to pay for the staff. And so right. I just want to make sure that when we do this, that we can not only support paying for the facility, but we can support having the correct staff to do it. So that's where the savings is. The lowest savings in here was 2021, and then the savings increases quite significantly. Okay, so I guess I didn't look carefully enough on that. So building a facility of this, or adding on to the existing facility does produce a savings. For does produce a savings. Madam Chair, if I, if I can yeah. interject, that this, this projections and those operating costs do not include the cost of taking out additional debt. That's what I was, and, that's and, the question, and, and that's the question that I did There's some significant yeah. pieces that I need yeah. to add to the next Got steps. It. That's the piece that I didn't see that. This, yeah, it's this. not in there. What I was looking at is just staffing, the Mona saving, the staffing, how really much do we have to pay for facility is what I was looking at. Yeah. And we do need to know how much it is to run the facility and have the maintenance. So without that piece, it's really hard for me to really wrap my head around that. So, so Madam Chair, if I could, if you look at the next steps, portion of your, of your handout. There are three things that I would add to that. Um, I, I personally believe that, and, and you do have the full report, uh, John sent the final corrective report Friday afternoon, and I just distributed that via email to you during this meeting, so you have that for your review. We'll attend both of we'll attend that to the minutes for this meeting so that everybody can see that report as well. Um, but the the three steps that I would, I would add, uh, A, we I would recommend that, that the board adopt this report as being a completion of the project that we tasked uh, John and his, his group to do for us. Um, but that sometime uh, yet this year, we do a full cost benefit all, of all the options. Okay. And, and I appreciate the comment about getting the court's narrative and, and the judge's opinion about what, uh, what they see coming down the line for us, because we are, we are looking, we're projecting out 20 years on this, uh, mm -hmm. so we do want to take a look down the road at that. So we want to see a full cost benefit, and there's a lot of things that we haven't included in here. Um, I mean, the, the number of hours that our deputies are on the are, are patrolling and not available in the county, how much does that free up time to, to do better job patrolling, or how does that affect the schedule of the, of the deputies and their patrolling within the county? We haven't looked at any of those pieces yet. Um, we will continue to review the opportunities for partnership Border Patrol. Mm -hmm. So whatever that ends up looking like, we, we want to fully vet those opportunities before we task anybody with designing with an architectural design. We want to know what program we're going to be designing before we spend money designing it. And then, um, and then the third thing is, is I, uh, in having conversations with the administrator from Chisago County, they just completed a project, and uh, we missed the opportunity a couple of months ago before they opened it up, they had an opportunity for uh, officials and commissioners to spend a night in the new jail before it was actually commissioned oh, and opened. Brilliant. <laughs> so I think, you, I think the only way you actually get to spend a night there now is to, oh. to actually do the crime so you can oh. spend some time there. I'm not actually recommending you do that. But he did invite us to come down and visit the facility and go through the process and review uh, the, the, the process and the, and the data that they reviewed before they made their decision and the things they learned through that process. So at some point, I would highly recommend that we take them up on that offer and, and, we, and we do that. When we know what it is we are doing. So that when we get into the technical components of designing this and the Department <coughs> of Corrections requirements and the local flavor on that, that you all have an understanding of what those things mean so that um, so that we can make an informed decision going forward. So this, there's several components in here. Um, 
I would anticipate that we would get into October and November and we would um, have a cost benefit that we could go forward with. Um, that sometime before the end of the year, uh, we bring to the board the opportunity to, to move forward with architectural design, knowing those things. Um, we're, uh, we're, we're working with a number of about $100,000 to begin the design and, and review process, and we'll be including that in the 2019 budget so that we have that there. In September, when we're adopting the preliminary budget, we'll have set money aside so we can be, start that process, but we won't start it until 2019. So just just understand it's a very it's a very big project. Um, when we we will also be looking at our financial management plan, and we took a shot in the dark when we did the financial management plan last year, and we put a, a much higher number in for this project um, because we were looking at we were shooting for the midpoint between doing nothing and creating a full new criminal justice center. And so I think we put eight or ten million dollars in. in as in as a marker for 2021 to do this project. You can see we're proposing scaling way back right now. Um, one, of the, one of the things that if we, if we work something out as a partnership and we bring another agency on board, we have to be able to do so in a way that has no net change to the public via the county levy. Right. So John's comments about, about programming um, a project that has the minimal impact and still meets all the requirements. It's the minimal impact on the local taxpayers, um, but it's also, um, it also will, will expand our ability to provide these services. But any other option we design will have to be in partnership so that our out-of-pocket costs, as it were, will, will be very similar to what we're proposing at this point. So there, there's, you're not seeing the full Right. Okay. Yeah, I didn't think so, and that's what. <laughs> and, it's like, and that's really that beyond the scope of what we asked. Right. Of course, I, I understand that. John so that's why I think this is a great. Well, first that, step. Those would be the things that I would yeah. add to, to this to the next steps. There's three other things I would add to that, and those will be um, those will be on upcoming agenda meetings. So today, really, it's the questions of the report that we've been given, um, and the opportunity to accept this phase of the process as being completed. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other comments, questions? Thank you so much. <laughs> Appreciate you. this. Is a lot to go through in the future, but we'll, we will do it. I'll make the motion to accept the master plan. I would second that motion. Any other questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Our next item on the agenda will be Rena and Sophia. <laughs> We're going from the ground to the tower. That's what we're doing. I just need to So good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Mm -hmm. So as as, uh, as you know, we've um, been on a quest for four years to prove the way we deliver IT services. Um, a lot of that's been about infrastructure and modernization and um, getting, getting our, our whole infrastructure more resilient and redundant so that, so that we can uh, um, make sure that our network is up and, all, and that it's secure. And the next phase of really what we have to do now um, it is about policies, it's about processes, it's about contracts, it's about the things that make all the work we've done so far sustainable. So this morning um, I have a contract and I have three policies. And this is, uh, you'll see more of this for me in the future. Um, I know you've seen a lot of contracts. This is a different one um, than we usually have done. And I think it addresses a concern uh, that I've had and I know that um, a couple of commissioners in the past have expressed concern about. Um, like many departments in the county, we're pretty much one deep in staff. So you take somebody like Rowan, who's our radio analyst, he's the only one we have, and he supports 11 towers and over 700 radios and pagers. So when he goes on vacation, he's never really on vacation. Um, we have informally in the past had a couple of people on call um, Jeff Nimitz, notably, and also Dwayne Navy, who did 
did most of this work in the past. What uh, the the action that I'm asking for this morning is to actually um, is to actually formalize that that relationship with Jeff Nimitz, Jeff uh, Nimitz Consulting, um, where where we actually have a professional contract with him that states expectations. You need to re you need to respond within a certain period of time. You need to carry this level of insurance. You need to make sure that you've been approved by the BCA to enter our new dot buildings. All of those things. Um, we have used him in the past, so that money is already in the budget. We're formalizing that relationship, is all we're doing here, so that to protect both Jeff and ourselves in that relationship as he does that backup work for Rowan. So my request this morning is simply to approve this professional services contract between Cook County and Jeff Nimitz Consulting to provide those backup on-call services for, um, for radio communications. And I'm taking questions right now. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, um, and thank you, Rena and Ron, for um, this proposal. It makes sense to me. You're already doing it. Mm -hmm. um, this just formalizes it, and it makes it clear. Um, so I think this is a great idea. It's been um, going on for years, um, mm -hmm. and um, Jeff Nimitz definitely knows our towers, and um, it makes, makes total sense. It's good partnering with um, the private community, too. Ah, good work, yeah. I support this. Sorry to interrupt. Um, we went back and forth with this draft a few times. Did when did the change get made that we were uh, contracting with Jeff Nemitz consulting the business entity? Um it I uh, just he asked to he, he asked to do that because that's what his business is. Okay. is I need to make another. I just need to make an addition to the contract. I need to add a little bit of language okay. about making sure that um, that entity continues as a registered Minnesota okay. uh, business entity if we're going to contract with it instead of with him personally. Okay. So that's all I gotta that. do. Okay. Um, so I just ask that if uh, commissioners approve this agreement, um, they uh, approve it in its basic format with um, the addition of some recommended language by the county attorney. Mm -hmm. Okay. So no. Molly, would this then cover if Jeff Nemitz consulting had employees, they would be covered under this contract? Right. The I mean, the main um, goal is that the, um, the county knows who it's contracting yep. with and is able to hold that entity, whether it's a person or a business entity, responsible for yep. uh, the obligations of the contract. And if uh, Jeff Nemitz signs the contract, then he's pers he may be personally responsible um, as the principal for the business entity, yep. but I mean, I could go. And about it, but we, we it's have pretty boring. we have requirements in there about um, what certifications they right. need and what yep. security processes. So, um, well, you know, we wouldn't have to have this contract if we just took down all the towers and shut off the radios. But we're not going to. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it's just, it's just <laughs> out of our proposal you're making. <laughs> yeah. All right. You know, that's not the one I'm making because I'm the tower queen. <laughs> Motion to approve with attorney's recommendations. I'll second that. Any more questions, comments? All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Molly, I'll, I'll send you the brief the most recent one after this meeting. Okay, and word Paul? Yeah. Okay, okay. okay. so um, next up I have. Um, a policy, it's a little bit of an unusual policy, but it um, dawns on me that we need this policy. We've talked a lot uh, in recent years about um, our towers and about co-location on our towers. We have a brand new tower ordinance that talks about um, encouraging co-location on our towers, and uh, we've brought, it, brought several contracts um, to you in the last year which um, for people who, or for entities who've been on our towers that have never paid to be on our towers, and there are a few more of those coming. Um, but the question often comes up, and 
we've got cell service now, and, and we're continuing to do other towers with um, entities that exist on our towers. What, how, do you, how do you pick a rate? What is the rate? What do you charge people in your towers? And, and obviously, um, this isn't the same thing as uh, a widget. It's not, um, you know, like when, when we talk about how, many, how much it costs per copy, we can put five cents on a copy, and a copy is a copy is a copy, right? But towers have varying value, depending on their location, um, depending on how high you put on, how, the height you put somebody on the tower depending on the weight of the equipment that you put on the tower. There are lots and lots of factors. So what this, what this policy seeks to do is, um, is, is try to just basically define two types of tenants. The, the market-based um, the market based rate that we talk about in there really is looks at a tenant and says, are you putting equipment up there so you can make a profit? Cell companies fall in that category. Um, commercial radio stations might fall in that category. Um, you know, things that we don't even know about yet might fall in that category, like when there's transmission for self-driving cars or whatever <laughs> else it is that might come in the future. Um, but the whole reason somebody seeks to put equipment up there is for their shareholders. It's to make money. It's to provide a service that they can charge for. In that case, we're saying, we should be applying a market-based rate. rate. What's the value of that space to that person? Um, and so far, that's pretty much how we've been approaching cell phone companies. They come up, they have some idea of what the market value is. And um, they usually throw out a pretty you know, good number that's based on sort of standard formulas that are out there. And by the way, these formulas are always kind of moving. So that's the other problem with creating a standard rate. So um, the, other, the other group of entities that are out there are more locally based. They're the WTIPs, they're the, um, they're the you know, stamp vouchers, which we did a contract with before. They're the people that might use space on our tower to, um, to support operations in their own business or provide a surface locally, but they're not making a profit out of it, right? Um, so somebody might use a tower to put up an antenna to provide radio contact between their employees. That's what Sam Dodge does. Um, it also would include many of our partners that are out there um, who are other public safety entities that are on our towers currently without contracts. So the DNR, US Forest Service, Border Patrol, uh, NOAA, Weather, those, those entities. How do, we, how do we charge them? Obviously, market rate doesn't work. Um, but free doesn't help us support the operations of our, of our um, towers either. So this would look more at creating um, an operation, operational cost based rate. We've been working with that. It's not really relevant because, again, those could change. But they would look at what are the actual costs of somebody being on that tower. So, you know, snow plowing for that tower or replacing a light if it has a light on that tower. Um, uh, regular structural um, inspections on that tower, the cost that it takes to maintain operationally that tower, and how do we then divide that among the tenants on that tower. That, so the, the rate is significantly lower, but it helps us cover our cost instead of the county subsidizing all of those people. They're all contributing to that operational structure. So that's really what this rates policy seeks to do is to give us a way to talk about two different groups of people, two different groups of tenants, excuse me, and how we would approach rates and them um, in the future. Do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I think just for context, it's important for the commissioners to know and the public to know too that it's this because we have these rate policies, they don't stand alone. This policy will be used in conjunction with the tower request use policy that we already have, tower facility policy, which defines priorities. So just because we have an operational cost model for, say, nonprofits, that doesn't mean we're going to allow or load all of our towers up with nonprofits at the expense of public safety. Public safety is the priority in that policy, and this is to be used in conjunction with that policy. And I think that's an important 
point when we're talking about how we're applying these rates. Just because we have a rate doesn't mean you're guaranteed a spot on a tower. We have plans and uses for specific towers, and that other policy that we brought to you before lays that out. It's a really good point, and 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 I guess the point is, is once you have re made a request, and we have determined if there's room on that tower, and we need to do a contract, where to begin with the re <coughs> determining the rate for that, and that's where this comes in. So there is. I kind of gave it to you out of context, so I appreciate that Rowan gave you out of context. Um, I think one, one line on here that's very important is just the very last line of the contract uh, that goes with the operational cost basis rate, is that specific agreements may include services in lieu of payment. So take somebody like Greater River Energy, for example. Um, Greater River Energy, uh, in some cases, they're on our towers, but in some cases, we're in their buildings. You know, and we're in their building for free, they're in our tower for free, there's, you know, there's an exchange of things, and so we might not actually exchange money, but we might, it, within our agreement, say, you can be here and we can be here. Um, and the contracts will be able to reflect that, because they all offset operational costs. So we put that in there because that's reality mm -hmm. of, of the world that we already deal with. Mm -hmm. Any questions on this at all? It's a little different, but... I think it's important to have this as a guideline for us going forward so that we can um, know how to, how to proceed in this unknown land that we find ourselves in. When you do a contract with someone, do you specify the amount of time, like for a year, two years, or how do you contract? Most of, most of our contracts are five-year contracts with five renewable Period. So many of the contracts, once they're in place, are 20 to 30 years in length. Um, and um, quite often, particularly on the commercial ones, they have um, they have an escalator every year. So like um, some of these above Grand Marais, every year our, our uh, lease rate goes up 3%. So over that 20 years, it continues to grow and reflects that cost. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think this policy is really important. Um, we are now in the tower business, and it seems like a good place to start. Um, I can see there be developing new categories, too, as, as you get going. Um, um, and it was really helpful to get public safety as the priority. It's hard to make those um, thoughts into the future. If, you're, you're, if you've got 25, 30-year contracts or um, it's hard to project the kind of use this one tower is going to have and who's going to be on it and for how long. Um, project the future. Mm -hmm. You know, what are our tower needs going to be for the future with that, those kind of lease um, terms that's hard. So this whole thing feels like it's hard in a way because um, um, you don't know what the future brings. However, for today, I can't imagine not having a policy because how do you you got to start somewhere. <laughs> so, and otherwise, it's, there's not fairness, and people are making commitments to be on the towers, financial commitments, and um, and now it's very stressful for staff to be negotiating contracts when um, there's no policy <laughs> to to back it. And, so, um, and to to your point, um, a lot of this is about fairness. It's about uh -huh. a consistent approach for where we start. You know. Right based on a definition of who's requesting it. And I think the specific agreements may include services and low payments is a really important clause because that, that gives you that flexibility to be, to customize to the client and um, that is really important to this whole agreement. So I, it looks good in my opinion, a lot of, a lot of good work. Yeah. Well, as a member of the Safety and Transport, Transportation and Safety Committee. I've been involved in this and discussions and appreciate your work. And uh, I feel that we we need to always look at value. You know, what what is what is something worth, even if it's in kind or in service. And this is a good move, I think. And you know, when we work with the communities and nonprofits or commercial ventures that we think in terms of value and, and then how how can we you know effectively take care of our maintenance or our future 
you know, needs as well. And, and so it's a good move, and I think we could do this in other area of budgets as well. Uh, uh, it's called value engineering. <laughs> And, you, and you've done some engineering on this in, in two different levels, and I think I know you've put a lot of work into it and covered all the angles, and so thank you both. Yeah, it's a good, good recommendation. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Duker? Thank you for putting it together. It's hard to grow up. <laughs> I mean, we've just always, because we're so small, it's just always been a handshake and a phone call, and, a, and it makes it tough for you in your office. And, you know, personalities get involved in everything else, and so I probably wanted this to be done a long time ago. So I'm glad that you put it together, and it's not a 10 page. It's pretty easy for you to go back and refer to this and make it pretty simple. It'd be interesting to see how the community reacts because everybody wants us to stay the way we were 20 years ago, but I'm glad that we're growing up, and I think this makes it simpler. At first, it may seem like we're putting in more rules and regulations and policies, but I think that this makes it fair, which is what you're really trying to do, is make it fair and make it so that it isn't a simple phone call. It's not who you get in the office first. It's not a sheet of paper on someone's desk that you refer to that we did before. So thank you for doing it. I know that it wasn't easy to make it into this format. But I think, you know, the handshake history of, of things in the county. And I, I understand how that even happens. Mm -hmm. But when the people who did the handshaking are no longer there, right. and then suddenly you have to support something at 2 in the morning, you don't even know whether you're supposed to. Yeah. And there's a lot of liability for the county and all of this. Just getting things into contracts so that we know mm -hmm. who's responsible for what and who has insurance. And I know I'm singing Molly's song here, but um, <laughs> but we, you know, it's it's just very important to me, regardless of the of of the revenue. But there is revenue involved, and there are costs involved. And um, as we've talked about many times, you know, this is our opportunity to go from a huge liability to the county that we have to continue to invest in because of our public safety communication. To making it more of a strategic asset but to the benefit of many people in the county. So this is just, I think, one more building block that we It need. makes my job easier when someone calls me and says, oh, Rowan wouldn't let me on the tower. Well, I know we have a policy. So <laughs> blame Rowan for everything. But I mean, for us as commissioners, we can say we have a policy for that. There's a reason for it. And you know, without a doubt, we know that we are doing everything we can the way we're supposed to do it in the most fair way to do it so thank you for making my job easier too yeah thanks for getting this together <clears throat> I know we have some and we can get people on your contract now we do have some towers that, have, that need to be replaced and I know you know in kind it doesn't help us pay for our towers no. No, they're kind of expensive yes, we have to replace them People think they have the right to be on the towers, actually. They can sign a contract like everybody else. Mm -hmm. Okay, motion to approve. Support. Um, uh, any more questions, comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thanks. Thank Thanks, Ron. Thanks, Ron. He's going to leave. No, I'm still going. No, I'll be back. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're going to go on break. Again. I'm I'm waiting for my chair to come up again. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, Thank you. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. there are a lot of policies that need to be written. There are, there are many of them that maybe were on the books or not um, that are very out of date. This is one um, that I was working on a couple of years ago. There's actually two of these policies. One is uh, internet and electronic mail acceptable use policy, which is for all employees. Um, the scope of it actually is all employees and elected officials who use uh, county provided um, tools, including internet here within our county buildings and, um, and email. What's appropriate to use these that, you know, what's appropriate to, to do with our email, like probably not using it as your uh, contact for your bank accounts is probably not a good idea. 
And it, it goes through and it, um, it talks about roles and responsibilities, particularly about how we use it, our email accounts and internet for personal use um, as, as uh, what you should and shouldn't do and what's acceptable and what isn't. So it's something certainly that um, all of our new employees have um, been given when they come in. Um, what's kind of made me get back to it and review it again from a few years ago was a couple of things. One, we're going to be adding um, several uh, employees to our email who are not usual office employees, who aren't used to having these county resources. Um, in the highway department and uh, recycling and um, in the maintenance areas. So I want to make sure that they understand how to use these tools appropriately. So that, that brought me back here to review it one more time. The other, the other piece in the uh, first policy, the Internet and Electronic Acceptable Mail Use Policy, is this idea of retention of email, which Molly and I have been having a lot of discussion about how do we get our data managed better in terms of state retention laws by the different departments. So we added language in here about uh, email retention and responsibilities for that. And I'm fully aware, if you were to ask me, are we doing that today? We are not. But what we need to do is start with a policy that gives us the authority to do that with departments. And then from there, Molly and I will um, start working with individual departments to get our, I think, better data retention going. So this sets the groundwork for that. Um, one of the things that I would like to do, uh, this policy is approved today, is probably starting uh, in September. Um, I'll go department by department and uh, if there are department meetings, talk about this policy, make sure people understand it, and we're going to have every employee sign the sheet on the back saying that they agreed to those terms. Um, then this will be, become part of my annual um, operational calendar that once a year I'll review it, make sure it's still relevant. Um, if there needs to be changes, we'll bring them here to amend it. And if there don't need to be changes, or if they do, we will then go back to employees, you know, distribute the policy, ask them to read it again, and resign. It's become an annual event to keep this in people's uh, forefront of their minds of um, what's appropriate to you, so, you know. So, I don't know if you have specific questions about this. Does it apply to the commissioners also? Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. Okay. You'll meet with us? Yes, I can. I can certainly do that. If we, okay, good. I would, I would be happy to do that. Okay, comments, questions? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I just um, would have an overall screening by personnel, maybe? Um, I'm just, I'm, I'm questioning the word should. It just should hold up in a sort of a personnel document on personal use of email. Is the word should? I like shall. Okay, shall <laughs> implies that you will. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would prefer that word being changed. It just seemed like there were a lot of unnecessary commas in there, but um, other than that, um, it's extremely complicated. Um, and it only gets complicated when it's used for personal use. Mm -hmm. um, company. It's a company tool being used for personal use. Mm -hmm. And that's where I have a big question mark. Um, Can you specifically? Well, like, how, how much personal use should you have on a company tool? Should. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I always see it like um, before there was email, and you're in an office. And you have you take um, a phone call from you family. take a phone call. Got it. Got it. Got it. I I I think sometimes people also, if you look at this, um, would put it on IT's responsibility to monitor this, and I don't think that's really our role. I see it. I see it more um, as uh, department heads um, who are managing their employees <coughs> need to be aware that if there are productivity issues because their employees are spending too much time doing something on the internet or something, that that's more their res responsibility. And I think the policy reflects that. These are guidelines. No, you shouldn't be running your own business on the, on the county um, site. And people need to also understand that everything that happens on email is potentially public information. So 
um, a lot of it is complicated mm -hmm. for that reason. You know, if you are putting a lot of stuff out there and personal stuff, um, somebody can request that. <laughs> and that can become very public. So this it's is good to have that in the document, yes, it is. spelling it all out. This is actually, um, I didn't make all of this up, obviously. It's a combination of different ones that I've seen, but this is pretty standard um, <coughs> protocol for it's language. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm pretty sure if you Googled this kind of a policy, you, you, would get find, <laughs> you, would, you wouldn't find all of it, but yeah. you'd, you'd find it in different ones, pieces of it. There's, there's a lot of um, very, very standard language in here that's across many government policies. And that's why I think it's important to, to also go to departments and ex and walk through some of the, especially the end user policy pieces, make sure that people are clear why those things are in there. Mr. Bershaw? Yeah. Well, I, it's good. I know I worked in an environment where one of the first schools to have email in the late 80s. And, we had to develop this right away because you know the potential for abuse of the system is high mm -hmm. and I think getting it closer to where the supervisor is is, is to the advantage because if there are problems and you don't have a policy uh, you can't deal with it as a supervisor and so long overdue thank you <laughs> mm -hmm. <coughs> When new employees start, will they come to you, or is this just be another part of their packet? Yeah, this would be, and that's a good question. Um, right now, um, it's HR that actually distributes this and okay. takes the signature. I just think this is really, really important, and I hate for it to get lost in the mm -hmm. three days of education or five days mm -hmm. of education you need when you get hired. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many things that we say, oh, does this get added to HR, does this get added to HR, and I'm really concerned about Pretty soon it's going to take two weeks to get somebody to start from the day we bring them in with all this stuff they have to sign, but this is really important. It's, it really is another, and I keep talking about liability issues for the county, but mm -hmm. this is uh, really tries to address that. Yeah, I would way. hope that people read it and don't just sign it and say they acknowledge it, because some of us here have had the Republican Senate subpoena us for our <laughs> electronics and so it wasn't just the county email that went to them so mm -hmm. it's big it's important so thank you thanks Ernie. okay motion to approve changing the shoulds and the shalls if necessary <laughs> shoulds to shalls okay all right the other questions or comments <laughs> all in favor aye oh, we didn't get a second yeah. yeah. oh. Support. Okay, I thought you did. He supported. He's okay. He's okay. So the other the other policy behind this <clears throat> is um, actually goes with this one. So if you're uh, in an apartment like the attorney's office or the sheriff's office that handles a specific kind of data known as criminal justice information (CJI), which has a very specific uh, definition, um, there's also data restrictions around. Um, what you do with that data and how you handle that data. And that it should never be emailed, for example. It should only um, exist in a record management system like our Zucker system and how, how, that's, how that's managed. So this policy also um, was actually written a few years ago. And um, they use it in the Sheriff's Department with new, new folks over there just to make sure that people know how to handle this special data. This is actually a policy that is really required um, by the BCA around that. So we've had this one in place for a while, but it's never been formally approved. So I bring it here today to ask you to, to do that. I'll make that motion. Sure. I'll second it. Any other questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Rena. Thank you all so much. Look forward to more policies and procedures. Oh, yeah, they're pretty exciting. I was just really glad you guys didn't have me follow the dog, you know, because I, I, I never like directly follow dogs and kids. You <laughs> <laughs> did follow the dog. <laughs> 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 Not directly. Pet the dog and then approve the policy. Yeah. Isn't that so yeah. fun? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah, and they're looking at 
Anyway, Phil, thank, thank you. you. Thanks for your time. Um, would anyone like a five minute break? Yes, yes please. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's treats over there. Uh, okay, I was eyeing that up. We need a pop-up, mate. Isn't that something? Yeah. <laughs> pop up I didn't know if my knee was going to follow me. Though. That's what I saw. Oh. Busy? <laughs> Long night, too, huh? Long day here. That's good. That's good. Yeah. 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 Oh, good. Is that the number you should Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you got campaign posters up everywhere. Oh, yes. The yard signs. <laughs> well, it's over now. Yes. Wait for the results. Yeah. Uh, no, the the, the I camera's to. probably still on. A good turnout, at least. I think so. I think the absentees. Two districts are getting a lot of votes. Is it now? Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's just, I know I worked one of the elections and it was presidential election and there were like 15 percent of the people that didn't vote in the primary. The people that were politically active didn't even bother on the mail ballot. You know? yeah. oh. Well, congratulations on being loony, Molly. <laughs> That was such a sham. I should have won. Um, so now you have something time. serious you to really, deal with. You really were best. And Border Patrol. Judge you well. Is that what it is? Is it Border Patrol or Homeland Security? It's judged based okay. on the class. Homeland Security is and parent to Border down Patrol down and, okay. and... Only two of us showed up. So what we're talking about. Border Patrol. So I got last... Serious? I, I don't know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no. I guess. Oh, well. I'm I joking. But, just uh, it's, it's, just, it's judged by a clause, and that we could uh, I didn't have any of the family there. Lease agreement? Down for oh, it. like the 20 years. Yeah, the right. other guy like got nine right. kids, and he had like <laughs> four of them there in an audience. If we get to the point that we have anything, that would be uh, good. So it's not. Um, this it's a title that's based on skill level. Skill level. It's a popularity. That's what happened right here. Start working. Yeah, like there's the tagline. Get some on your Facebook page, and we'll update you. Yeah, that would be. I see it now. Yeah, I guess that would be a better. I'm gonna do it again next year and hope for it. Potentially. The rains came in. I was I was in town. Depends upon how it goes. I I got to town right before the rains. We we would be in control more than we would be. I mean, we would have. You'd think we'd be in an advantageous situation because there are other only other options to build or not have it at all. There's probably some decent units in here. Yes, but there's still lots of numbers on the for some short person. Technically, it's the one law well, that makes the city because it doesn't have. Uh, can't have the this. Oh, God, this is embarrassing. Can I run to the restroom and then yeah. come back? I don't remember. I better walk if you really need to go badly. Yeah. Oh, now I know. Look at all these good treats, these good healthy treats. Thank you, Myron. <laughs> yeah, you know, they're yeah. not that bad either. No. I meant the car. Really? You have to like it. Yeah. When are you playing at church again? Hmm. Uh, 26. You want to play it? Is that going to be the... Yeah. 26. Yep. Will that Not be this our... coming Sunday, but the following Sunday. Oh, I think that'll be that uh, blended? No, it's not a blended. I don't know if it's going to, but it's... We're going to do the folk mass as long as we can find a cancer and... And see, I didn't talk to Eric, but I talked to his wife, and she was going to give him the message. Okay. Yeah, I have to talk to. Twenty-sixth. 
I think that's the door. Yeah. I don't have my phone. Don't put it on the spot. Is it legal? <laughs> yeah, well, I think I'm yeah. going to be around. Well, that day. good. Okay. So we did such a good job the last time we did that, so let's do it again. Yeah. No, I just to make sure. No, we play music together. Sweet. <laughs> have, have for me. I was yeah, I was up at the care center yesterday helping people vote. Yeah, they're all oh, over And I saw your name. I'm like, oh, yeah, he's still doing the Sunday. Yeah, it, but I get when I'm in town, which is usually yeah, two or three times, time. sometimes four times a month. I enjoy it. Well, you I've got these say, if you don't all these people that are in the neighbor B. They seem to have a. Yeah, good luck. With the change in that. My boat seems a lot more comfortable. It's com more comfortable than this thing, and, it, and it's really old. <laughs> Some of them, it's like Bernice, she's getting her kid. It feels like my boat seems <laughs> <seat. laughs> Is it really? I think it is. No, excuse me, eight. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It's, you see people age more and more. Right? You know, she's just good. Physical limitation. Starting to slide. Oh, I this temperature. I used to eat so That did it. I'm very sensitive to my balance and Apparently. position. I'm an old athlete. No. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Give it a few whacks. <laughs> well, it makes a difference in the comfort because well, sure. of your weight. Mm -hmm. I got a bad back. It makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. We will sit up straight. Put my feet on the floor. Next surgery is taking a chance of the break to adjust chairs. <laughs> or just move <laughs> over. To try it for once. Switch. Musical chairs. <laughs> and you can play. Did you get a better one, Mickey? Yeah, this one's a little bit. Of, of course, this is somebody else's chair, though. This is karma. Yes, this is karma. This is karma. You get out what you put on. Oh, that's good to believe in the opportunity. Yeah. I think you're excellent. That's a very strange chair. Yeah, all right. Oh, there's one word. You'll figure it out. Yes, sir. Okay, we're all back. Yeah, we're all ready to go. To yeah, 20 years doesn't seem like it's forever anymore, does it? On the agenda. Mike, pleasure to meet you. We have Janine Hill. Great. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the board. My request today is to approve to post. Uh, advertising for a maintenance technician custodian in our maintenance department. This person would primarily work at the YMCA. Um, this position is replacing uh, two custodian positions at the YMCA. We're hoping to replace that with one full-time maintenance slash custodian position. Maintenance being doing a little more related to pool maintenance. Okay. <clears throat> that would be something that they would need a little training on, I take it? There, yeah, we're, we would post it with like pool certification desired, but mm -hmm. chances are they would need to get training on being certified to maintain the pool. And minor maintenance? Um, nothing major? Yes. Nothing major, but minor mechanical maintenance versus uh, the previous positions were custodial, which were pretty much pick up and cleaning. Mm -hmm. This would be minor repairs. Mm -hmm. Door knobs, that kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. Okay, we'll open it up for questions or comments. Commissioner Deshaun? No comments. <clears throat> Commissioner Dukert? We're replacing two full time with one full time. Yes. Can you repeat that like five times because we often that we replace one with more. <laughs> so this more. Is nice. Madam, Madam Chair, Commissioner Duker, if I could, we had previously had one full time and an additional eight hours of part time. And that's what we're proposing that we would go back to. Um, this past year, we have actually had allocated because we could not find that eight hour person. We had 1.5 FTE allocated to the YMCA. And um, we did not specifically ask for 
the maintenance the technical component, uh, which is why we're, we're working on the job description to make sure that we get somebody that has that. Ability. So yes, we are reducing the allocation of hours. It's just nice because I always hear why you keep adding more and more and more, and we're taking a look. We have a situation where we were able to step back and take a look, cross our fingers that we get the right person, and that we're able to follow through on this. So anybody out there, if you know someone with the experience listed, please encourage them to apply. Great job. <coughs> Well, I have uh, some concerns. I'm more aligned uh, as the county rep to the Y. And I think we're meeting this Friday, but we have some issues there with maintenance. And I don't know if this will take care of it, but uh, we have had a lot of complaints from the public on uh, the maintenance of the building. Specific, and I, maybe they're more renovated in nature because of the mold is getting showers and so forth and of course that's been obvious from the very beginning I mean I was involved in the checkout of that building punch out so I, I I would hope that maybe by adding the maintenance aspect of this that that will be an appropriate kind of issue but uh, I don't think that we were wasting our hours I think we still have had some <coughs> cleanliness issues there and so I don't want to that, that to go away without noting that uh, uh, that is a concern from the public mm -hmm. and our staff there as well as for myself Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I am um, very much in favor of this and if it's not enough we'll look at it again but um, it makes sense to me um, so I would make the motion to approve the posting to advertise maintenance technician custodian opening in the maintenance department. Support. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. I'm opposed. Okay. <clears throat> Great. Thank you. Thank Katie. you. Next we have Tim Nelson. <laughs> Chair, Commissioners, mm -hmm. just have the one item uh, before you today, and that's the replacement of recycling uh, trailers, the multi-bin uh, green drop-off trailers. Uh, we, earlier this year, uh, I came before you, and we, we purchased a, a new one to add to the fleet to use over at the Hovland uh, site, and that's, that's worked uh, really well. The, the one problem that we run into, you know, we always try to make these trailers go as, as absolutely long as we possibly can. Um, and we've worked with Protainer for on the design to try to extend out and beef up the, the flatbed. What we run into is very heavy uh, materials uh, that go and weigh down on it, and then uh, a lot of the road uh, salt and such that, that uh, impacts the, the frames uh, and such. And we end up with uh, sagging in those frames um, that we can only weld up so many times, and that's where we're at with another one of ours. We'd switched. From the metal to the poly uh, bins to lighten the load uh, and we've also um, worked with them to add you know new latch things to keep the lids up uh, you know so it's uh, easier for folks to use uh, in that sense so we've come to the point uh, in time where we have another trailer that's that's fallen apart to the extent that it's no longer really road worthy and so we would like to go ahead and replace that trailer I have a quote uh, in front of you for a replacement trailer um, and we would intend to uh, take it out of the uh, landfill, future landfill funds um, that we acquired the previous uh, trailer for, and as such, that would not be uh, an adverse impact on, the, on this year's budget. So in addition to that cost, um, we, we are working with them to get a good uh, undercoating to be able to protect the, the trailer as well. So not only looking for the cost of the trailer in there, but also the 1500 for the uh, undercoating protection as well. Mm -hmm. And this new trailer would have the mm -hmm. new arms that would keep yes. the... Okay, good. It's, it's getting better at the <coughs> Opti site. The um, fellow there just does a good job of trying to help people out when, when it gets too full too. Yeah. Madam Chair, we're getting a lot of materials. Uh, one of the biggest uh, increases in the amount of materials coming in in any particular site is the Opti site right now. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know 
what you can do about it other than purchase another trailer in the future. Well, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's uh, some of the businesses we're trying to work with to see if we can't just funnel that directly to the center instead of filling up those, those trailers. Oh, okay. okay, good idea. Okay, questions or comments? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. <coughs> um, my only um, question or comment is about um, where these trailers come in the budget process because we funded the last one with the future landfill of funding, or post funding this one with the future landfill. Um, is, you know, because we're trying to get all capital expenses, because 20000 isn't a small expense, as part of our budgeting process. And even if it's going to be coming out of that, to have it planned um, so that we don't just, so we have a plan for that future landfill money. And maybe if the plan is to keep funding the trailers out of it, but to have a, um, and I know it's evolving, so it's like maybe now we can figure it that way. We know, particularly with the growth in Tofty, and um, we can plan for some growth and try to manage it under the manage it under the budget process. So it's not like an emergency expense as it comes up. But I understand this. Madam Chair, Commissioner Stevens, and that that's absolutely right. We. We try to uh, keep these the, the trailers and the equipment uh, going as, as absolutely long as we can. And so, uh, at the end of each uh, year during the budget cycle, um, I, I work with the rank up there at the recycling center and say, okay, what, what do we anticipate any any pieces of equipment uh, going down and such? And, and we always try. Well, I think we can eke another year, okay. uh, yeah. especially you know, understanding Cost the concerns that we want to keep the costs yeah. down as far right. as the, the right. budget numbers go. Right. Um, and we we have probably enough in that that existing fund to, to cover the replacement of, of one set of each equipment um, that we have there in the center. Um, and so, if as long as the, the if we've had the concerns with the with the budget, it's it's been kind of my little go to so yeah. we don't have that adverse impact. But you're right, and, and right. I have had conversations with the administrator on that that we should uh, actually reflect that in in the budget. Yeah. It's just going to mean an increase because uh, you know I, I do have the life cycles kind of pegged out on some of the major equipment that we that we do have in there. Uh, some of them are up over fifty thousand dollars and such, and so um, I can plug those in. I do have those. Those the, the dates and the expected lifetime and such, but we always end up running a much much longer than than what the natural life cycles are, just because we're so good up there at, at uh, maintenance and uh, keeping the, the equipment going. So. so it sounds like the strategy is to spend less in the long run, and sometimes yeah. capital planning is about spending less in the yeah. long run. But it sounds like your plan is spending less in the long run is working so far. But it's still nice to have a yes. plan for that or even to have that conversation during the budget season, which is what we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Commissioner Bergen? Well, oh, I think it's a good idea to have the T-Flex bedliner. Uh, I'm sure that they have um, to the life of it, especially if it's new. Commissioner Dubner? So have you added funds to your 2019 budget to increase the future landfill to cover this? To replenish that, uh, Madam Chair, Commissioner Dukirk, I, I have not. Um, the expectations are actually uh, that we we don't really have, I, I, we don't anticipate the need for that fund in within the next five years or so. So again, because of concerns about the budgets and the numbers that we're being asked to present uh, and trying to be sensitive to that, I've, I've kept, you know, that out of, of uh, the, the budget process, but it certainly is an impact. Uh, each each pieces of equipment that we have uh, does take that out of that fund, and we understand that those funds can be depleted. And if if the board wants, we can we can definitely plug that into the budget numbers, but understanding that it, it will definitely have an impact. Not even if we do the whole 20, if we do half of it, just to be putting it back in there. I mean, this is why our fund balance has the brakes on it, because we kept saying we don't really need it, and we're in a recession, and we came up with all the reasoning in the world, and then an emergency happens. So, just something to consider. Commissioner Deschamps? 
How many years do you get out of these trailers? About 10 to 12. Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah. You, you drag anything up and down the shore in the middle of winter with the stuff they put on it. Now you're lucky you get that out of them. So. Having extra protection in the bottom helps. Yeah, just like doing it to our cars. Exactly. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Motion to approve with the T-Fox Badliner coating. Support. Any other questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thanks to Mary. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. quality public service. If you go on to uh, page two of the Highway Department budget handout, you will see a history of the road and bridge levy here in Cook County. Today we're here to talk about an average of 25% of Cook County property taxes. And for 2019, we're shifting a few priorities to minimize the preliminary levy request to 2.5% or $56,000. The next chart will review um, what we're looking at for revenue sources in 2019. Uh, one of the, we are one of the departments that's largely supported by outside sources, which enables Cook County to sustain levels of summer and winter maintenance services while offsetting the impact on local taxpayers for the same. In 2019, 73% of your revenues come from Minnesota's Highway User Tax Distribution Fund for construction and maintenance support, the county's transportation sales tax for designated projects, and a one-time $800,000 federal tip grant for the Gun Flint Trail project that we have in next year's construction program. Moving on to the expenditures of the Highway Department in the form of Highway Department services, over half of the revenues from the prior page translate to road <coughs> construction projects and their associated design and permitting costs. For 2019, we're proposing a decrease in the personnel budget in favor of maintenance supplies. I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. And thanks to the experience of your mechanics, foremen, and a dedicated accountant here at Cook County, we've worked together to reduce Cook County's equipment program to less than 4% of the preliminary 2019 road and bridge budget. I mentioned that we're looking at a shift in priorities for 2019 to minimize the request and levy increase. And uh, we're also, in other forums, you've probably heard me talk about increasing next year's chloride application. And we have done that as part of this budget. You will see an overview of 2017 maintenance supplies compared to what we're proposing for 2019. Uh, we might recall that 2017 was the year in which we didn't chloride our roads. We made a little bit of a start here in 2018, but we're continuing to hear from many constituents that we should consider increasing the chloride application for the 2019 budget, which we have done. Uh, next year's chloride program of $170,000 brings us closer to the level of service that we provided in 2016. Optimally, we would increase the chloride program another 20 to 30,000 to cover all of the roads that were last covered in 2016. And if we are hearing from many constituents that there are good reasons for chloriding roads besides the benefits to road maintenance, we would be looking at 250,000 to chloride all gravel roads in Cook County. 
Uh, that's not in the budget. I don't believe we've ever done that. In some neighborhoods, we do hear questions or concerns about potentially negative impacts of chloride. So we have not budgeted for chloride on all roads in the past. Uh, but if we could raise that to 190 to 200,000, I think that would get us closer to where we want to be. And the other area in which we're proposing a shift in priorities with respect to maintenance <coughs> supplies is shifting some funds from the elimination of the former maintenance supervisor position to additional class one, which is the gravel that we use for resurfacing our gravel roads. The, the budget that we've shown here would cover an additional three to four miles compared to what we were able to re-gravel in years past. Moving on to page six, uh, this chart represents Cook County's increase in road and bridge levy funds compared to the department's personnel budget for the same years. Uh, we're showing a net decrease in 2019 through the elimination of the maintenance supervisor position, as well as the elimination of engineer's benefits. The 2019 budget does include two currently vacant positions, uh, one being the maintenance worker one, which has been filled as a summer worker in the past, with the elimination of the maintenance supervisor position and the foreman spending more of his time assisting the engineer. We are looking for more boots on the ground. Uh, the second vacancy is the currently posted engineering technician position, uh, which we really need to deliver next year's program in particular. And uh, a diff different options for recruiting for that position, as well as the maintenance worker one, are expected to go before the personnel committee as well as the board this fall. Moving on to equipment, uh, this is our most significant change for 2019. The draft 2019 budget jumps to the conclusion that we will adopt revisions to the current equipment policy before the final levy is set. Um, we've discussed this at the department level and at the Highway Advisory Committee. We'll be bringing forward the finalized recommendations for Cook County's equipment replacement program to the September Highway Advisory Committee meeting as well as the board later this fall. Since the implementation of Cook County's equipment policy, we've learned from the experience of our own staff, we've learned from the experience of other counties, and by working together over the past several months, we've come up with what we believe to be more economical methodologies for an equipment program for a rural county like Cook County. Uh, we will be including mileage and condition as two of the factors to rate our fleet moving forward and this draft budget represents over $280,000 in taxpayer savings in 2019. But again, jumps to the conclusion that we will be re-looking at our equipment policy before January. For equipment, we do have um, a mini excavator payoff and greater financing. When we discussed Cook County's fleet, we identified pieces of equipment that we believe we will be selling, some things that aren't getting the use that we might have expected at the time they were purchased, but the only piece of equipment in our fleet that we could use that we don't currently have is a utility tractor, something a little more mobile to help us do sidewalk maintenance, for example, as well as some of those other smaller tasks compared to the heavy equipment that we use. We are looking at repairing one of the pickups in our fleet as opposed to replacing it. It only has 77,000 miles, so we put $5,000 in for a new budget or for a new engine to keep that pickup on the road. And uh, fuel is actually one of our largest equipment expenditures. Uh, we're looking at about $185,000 in fuel costs if the price stays the same for 2019. We do have $150,000 in the draft budget for capital replacement reserves. Again, we have uh, cut Cook County's equipment program by $280,000. However, we believe it's still responsible to maintain some level of capital equipment reserves in the event of an unexpected breakdown or to prepare us for the future. 
and to be clear, that reduction of 280 is after we have set aside the reserves. Oh, mm -hmm. so that's helpful. That is helpful. <laughs> Uh, moving on to one of the most exciting announcements for the 2019 budget is the projects that we are looking forward to. Uh, not unlike other departments here in Cook County or not unlike other county highway departments in Minnesota, there are more needs than available funds and we will tackle that bigger picture question of how we set priorities as part of the impending transportation plan effort, but at the same time we need a plan for next year. I mentioned that we received a one-time federal grant to deliver Gunflint Trail improvements in 2019. We have Self Shore Drive in the construction program funded by our state aid funds at a cost of a little over $2 million to reconstruct and replace the culverts on that rough road. Uh, we've talked about our bridge needs at past meetings and we are moving forward with the design services uh, with the hope of construction administration of the Casa one box culvert replacement at Two Island River. We need to uh, pave the section of Mineral Center Road that was delayed from this year's bid. Hopefully blacktop prices will stabilize by the springtime bidding season next year. And also the bond project on Moose Valley Road, the culvert replacement at Carlson Creek. Those are the five projects that we're looking at for construction in 2019. Uh, we are planning to recruit that fourth engineering employee augmented with some consultant assistance is how we're going to deliver this construction program in excess of $5.5 million. One of our highest priorities in town, uh, speaking of other projects and working ahead to future years, is the alternatives analysis and final design for 5th Avenue West. You will see that in next year's budget work will continue preparing for the County Road 45 project with the engineering costs being funded by the 2018 bond. And we are, will be looking for a more cost effective alternative for the Cross River Bridge replacement at Confluent Lake. So those are the projects that we will be working ahead on as part of the 2019 budget. The final shift in priorities that we're requesting for 2019 is starting a bridge replacement program for Cook County. The budget includes 118,500 in bridge program reserves to get started on engineering or match funds for eventual bridge replacements here. Um, we're looking at 14 structures that need to be replaced within the next 10 years, only two of which appear in this 2019 project list. So we know that we need to start working ahead for the future of our bridge system to keep those structures serviceable and qualify for outside grant sources by getting started on engineering projects. We will continue to keep seek the outside sources to uh, minimize the impact of our bridge needs, but, it, but I don't think it's something that we can go without starting to prepare for in 2019. And again, part of the impact of that is uh, a number of those bridges, and you might be able to tell us off the top of your head, are on county roads rather than CASA routes, which means that there aren't state aid construction funds available for those bridge replacement programs. And by seeking some of those outside grants and having matching funds available, we can minimize the levy impact significantly, potentially. So, thank you, Lisa. Thanks for all of your work on preparing the budget as usual every year. Also, a big thanks to the highway staff for their commitment to supporting the department's critical services on a day-to-day -day basis. And thank you for the opportunity to serve as a Cook County engineer. Uh, if there are any questions, we did bring some information with us, or uh, we can answer them at the budget <coughs> committee meeting next week. Um, anyone who might be listening later on could give us a call at the highway department, 387-3014, or direct any questions through Administrator Cashel as well. Thank you. This is so plain. It's so easy to follow. Very good report. So we'll have questions or comments starting with Commissioner Deschamps. The um, mini excavator payoff, is that the same one that we've had for two or three years now? We actually just got it uh, at the end of last year, and there was um, a, a commitment made at that time to rent it at a discounted rate for this entire year and then to do a payoff.
for years? No, no. We typically get a different rental every year. And in fact, we actually had a different rental through the entire active uh, maintenance season last year and then brought this one in at the end of uh, last year and maybe used it for a few weeks. But the reason for that was actually quite strategic. By going with that particular unit on the 2017 contract prices, we were able to stay in the mid $60,000 range versus over, I believe it was 80 or 82,000 on the 2018 state contract for the same unit. So we say it was between 15 and $17,000. I'd have to go back and check the records. Our, our original commissioner, our original contract was to carry the, the equipment that we used in 2016 and pay that out in 2017, and we deferred that and they honored that and they held our our lease rates for 2017 and delivered a new unit that then this year we're gonna, we're gonna pay off. So it did, uh, December, November, it came very late last it year. Came it came very late. It was at the very end of the construction season last year. And then the equipment rental, that's that 329 or 326? It, it's a couple of units typically, uh, and that's just a standing budget uh, line item, and it is the large excavator, and then this year, uh, that would also include the mini excavator. So in 2019, the mini excavator rental does go away. And it should just be the large excavator unless some other unusual need arises, such as potentially a roller. We have rented one of those for a short term if there's a specific project need or something like that. Thank you for keeping South Shore in the budget. Any of you aren't aware it was supposed to be this one. So I'm on the short list with some people. Sorry, things happen, but it will get done, hopefully. So thank you. And this is a great presentation, and we'll get the copy of the big one, too. Do you know one? Should we get that folder to It's in the book. It's in the book. In the book. Perfect. In the book. I missed that. I missed that big sheet without all of us being spread out across. Yeah, the that's because we pulled it. I know. <laughs> I'll read it later. We just got our books partway through the meeting this morning. So. Thank you for all the work that both of you have done mm -hmm. on this budget. Commissioner Bershaw. Well, thank you so much uh, to you two, especially, and uh, the staff, and trying to look at where we can have some savings. I, I often feel that if you're going to go looking for saving any costs, you look at the big ticket items because they may have the less impact over time, even though sometimes it's necessary to increase those big budgets. But, And I think from what I've been hearing uh, as a commissioner as well before when I served on the Highway Advisory Committee, I also want to thank uh, Commissioner Deshaw for his work on this as well because I know he's made some suggestions. So. I think uh, these cost savings are timely, and I think they reflect some of the concerns that have been ongoing about why we're doing what we're doing, and you're taking a serious look at that. And that's just really good management and planning, so thank you. And, and um, it's, it's, the results are apparent, and they're very positive, uh, I think, to indicate where we can look to maybe change things when we have a change in, in the, uh, leadership in that department. So thank you, Kristen, for joining us. <laughs> uh, I really trust your uh, professional background and commitment. Right. Um, so I had did a little drive the other day, and the bridge work is done at uh, Ski Hill. Not completed, probably, but you can at least drive across it. And that was projected to be done in August. Yay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. I know. Yes. Commissioner Siegel, thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just, and this is um, very impressive in its summary and its um, simplicity, um, but I know it's not simple. It just takes all those complex details and puts it in a very usable, user friendly approach. And I appreciate the context of history and then the context of the whole. It helps me see the big picture um, in both directions, which is really awesome. Um, and that there's um, some cost savings, and then that's been really well explained. Um, um, and that there's um, the chlorides back in the budget. Um, seems like it's the right thing to do. And um, it's fabulous. And that we're you know backed up with all the details. We can dig into it to our hearts and 
content, but I really appreciate having this big picture approach. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. There's no other questions. Appreciate all the work too. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. All right. So Brady's on the agenda now. Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, first item is uh, ask you to approve uh, date and time for the canvas board after the election. Uh, the dates allowed are August 16 or 17. I'd ask to set it early on the 16th at 10 a.m. in the commissioner's room. And then <coughs> also the members of the canvas board are two members of the, of the county board. It's not required. We need three for a quorum. So two members of the county board, the, uh, the mayor of the city, the court administrator, and myself, and we need three. So if there's anyone of you that uh, would attend, you could appoint them today. Otherwise, if you have a member of the public in mind, uh, we could approve them. Otherwise, it just gives me the authority to appoint someone. I have a couple of people in mind. So. That helps the fund back up, yeah. suspenders and belts. <laughs> so, um, motion to uh, ask for a motion to approve the date is August 16th at 10 a.m. in the commission. <coughs> Okay, so we have the motion. I move to approve the date. Okay. 16th at 10 a.m. Support. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Then do you need a motion for the person? That? If there's any of you that can make that date and wish to come, um, <coughs> otherwise give me the authority to make an appointment. Mm -hmm. But it place. has to be a county board who's not up for election. Right which would be either Myron or I, and Myron's covering a meeting for me because I will be gone, so there's your answer. I could do it. I'm, I'm not up for You're not up. <laughs> yeah. You're up, but you're not up. <laughs> yeah, okay. So I could do it. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks, Jan. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do you need a motion for that? Um, yeah, well, okay. yeah, we'll make a motion. Motion to approve, Jan. Okay, thank you. Support? All in favor? Aye. 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 Jan, you're approved. Okay. <laughs> That's a huge honor, Jan. You're approved. <laughs> I know. I'm taking it as that. There you go. Um, I think we'll go to 9C, nine, nine the state in the loop. We've just traditionally recorded this to you. It's not an approval. It's, uh, it's recognition of the, the state gives us each year. This is on our, um, obviously, our state tax forfeit lands. And last year, as you remember, we were shorted on, on this fund. Um, we had to reassess it. They were not pleased with our, or not agreeable to our method. And then they chose, in the meantime, they chose a number that was not reflective of either a, a reassessment or um, at all. So they corrected that, and we got the 56000 this spring to correct for last year. And this year, not only does this reflect that correction in the assessment, but the state also increased the <coughs> dollar per acre amounts for two of the categories on here, from $1.50 to $2, which resulted in another 67000 of increase. So now instead of $250,000, we have $374,000. Uh, that we received this year already and we'll be receiving next year. So that will be reflected in the budget for 2019. And then 9B is a budget amendment, which is this change in the state and rule of tax is now reflected in there. So the two major changes, um, they, were, they were major, so I wanted to do an amendment to reflect so 2018 reflected closely what we were actually doing. So this is the final um, union contracts and the comp study and all that came together shortly after the end of the year and then it took us some time to calculate all the final results. And then we were hoping to get uh, the statement of taxes adjustments and 
hoping to get the federal adjustment too. We still don't have the information on that. So I said, well, let's just go ahead and amend what we have. And know if we find out more later on the federal, uh, we may amend again. Um, that may not happen. So, so I would ask this approval. So this, I've included the first amendment we did in February, which was a small adjustment to ARC, but largely it was <coughs> including uh, E911, which had just been omitted, and that's a large budget. So that just increased revenue and expenses. So you see what we amended there, and then you see this proposed amendment. No change to the levy. We can't change the levy. So what this does is just changes the fund balance. So we had a use of fund balance. We were expecting to add to the fund balance, uh, just over 200000 And with all the changes in the including of the state new and tax, now we'll just use a small amount of the fund balance, 57000 so Instead of putting in, we have to take out a little bit. Um, so I'd ask for approval of that change. This reflects all the changes that uh, Kristen and Lisa were talking to regarding their budgets, so this will, now their 2018 budget will reflect all of the payroll changes and so will the services and so will the general fund for all comparison purposes. Okay. <clears throat> so first of all, any questions or comments before we do a motion, Commissioner? I would just like to, I mentioned it before, but in regards to the payment of taxes from the state, I am a member of the <coughs> club, uh, it's Northern Commons Land Use Conservation Board. Uh, John Angaro is working with us as well as through the Arrowhead Counties Association to help Cook County uh, deal with the $67,497 increase is very much appreciated, but when you look at uh, an increase of 50 cents per acre, the formula that they used to uh, arrive at this number is really been changed significantly for Cook County because for that one year we, we had that change in assessment uh, that was significantly lower, but the issue is that this increase of sixty-seven thousand uh, dollars. If that, if our our, it seems like our assessed values are going to go up somewhat, but we're going to be penalized for five years now on that. I guess you'd look at it as penalized. Whereas if you did this every one year or two years, more than likely we'd be getting more PILT payment for that year three, four, and five. So uh, uh, I really appreciate the work uh, and support. It's very rare that they're really targeting Cook County uh, for their efforts that they felt we were dealt with unfairly, so it's good to have that group behind us, uh, as well as the skills of the lobbyist John and Darrell to um, try to get that change job in the legislature. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if there's any questions on that, but wanted to elaborate that again. Thank you. So, so you're mm -hmm. saying we may have been helped with, say, relatively more than some other counties by that kind of change? Yeah, the, some other counties got significant increases, yeah. I mean, mil a million, I think. So the whole idea is to get that readjusted more frequently to our advantage because the year that they based this on was really not a good year for us on the assessment. <clears throat> okay, any other comments or questions? I just had a question about the net effect of fund balance. I originally thought it was the 57,000 plus the 222, but it's 222 Basically. minus the 57. No, no. Okay, it's so I, my original thought was correct. Right. So the net effect is about 280,000. Right, they're moving in the same direction. Okay, minus mm -hmm. fund balance that we originally intended to. Yeah. Okay, thank you. In, in the end, because of the state money, I mean the federal money, that we still don't know the category, um, we likely offset that. Right. It, it, regardless of what type it is. It may go to the highway department or to the general fund, but we probably offset that. Anyway. Okay. One, that's one time. Okay. Anything else? 
Okay, so I hear a motion. So moved. <coughs> Second it. Begrudgingly. <laughs> Any further comments or questions? Otherwise, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? So we sign. Pass. Thank you, Brady, on all of that. Thanks. Thanks for bringing that. <coughs> Moving on to administrator's update. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a couple of, <coughs> of items, and as always, I'll take questions if you have them after that. Um, uh, Brady Powers handed out your budget workbook, and our intention is to make those materials available on our budget website as soon as we can. Our next budget committee meeting is Tuesday next week. Uh, I'm to have these, these materials that are available now up on the website by then. Uh, I need to let uh, Brady and his staff get through the election before we uh, commit to getting that, those materials up there. Um, the, the only comment I would make that you, that you haven't seen, you just approved a budget amendment um, for 2018, and uh, next week you will see, perhaps before that, you will see the, uh, the summary of where we're at with preliminary requests for this year from our department heads. And what I will tell you is the last three years, um, the first blush on that summary budget has shown uh, a, a necessary levy increase of 27, 28, 30 percent. Uh, and I will tell you that this year's working number um, is a single digit number and that it's going to be much easier for us to meet. The, the goals that we set last year when we when we did take the bite and say we're going to balance the budget so next year we have a much more sustainable number. So just taking mm -hmm. all of the staff, all of the department requests, plugging them in, taking a look at what we have available, we're already in a single digit in a workable situation. So to that effect, the work that we did last year had the intended consequence. Um, and I want to give that number out yet because uh, we haven't had a chance to review uh, the preliminary budget submitted by Health and Human Services came in on Friday, and Brady and I have not had a chance to sit down with Allison and Lori to review that one, do that before we share that number. But um, I think that's all very good news. Um, agenda management software that we agreed to purchase, we will be doing training, uh, implementation schedule, reviewing with the company on Thursday this week. Monday next week, the primary users will be getting their individual training on how to, how to use the system. And over the course of the month of September, we will be um, transitioning our agendas for the commissioner meetings, for the human service meetings, and all for the planning and zoning meetings over to the new agenda management system. They'll still be available by a link through the county website, and it's just going to look different. And the format of the agenda is going to look a little bit different, but Part of the implementation is also giving them all of our materials so that they can make it look fairly consistent. So hopefully by October 1st, we're fully using that new system for all of those agendas. Um, <clears throat> there was a comment about uh, this morning at the beginning of the meeting about the cost of the Hovland Public Works facility and about the necessity for the Hovland Public Works facility. And I would want to make a correction that thankfully, we have not received uh, an OSHA compliance letter indicating that we have to shut part of that facility down. There is no letter. What we know is that there are components of that building that would not meet specifications if we had an inspection. So us planning to update or improve or correct those is, is, is an important part of us managing um, that facility. The primary reason for that facility is that the age of that type of construction in that facility has outlived its useful life. Um, the design of a new facility is to protect the equipment, to provide a safe place for our employees, and to provide a safe place to operate services in the east end of the county uh, for a long time into the future. And uh, one of the primary reasons that we rejected all the bids and went forward is that we bid at a point in time this year where we didn't get any local bidders. And we really do believe that we're going to be able to kind of much closer to the anticipated expense for, uh, for that project. I was just reviewing an updated opinion of probable cost from the Meyer Group, and they're still showing $950,000 for the building, right? which is not significantly more than the eight hundred and fifty that was shown a number of years ago. The problem is, is that there's demolition and site work and architectural fees and all of that. So we're still showing a full program of about $1.2 to $1.25 million for that project. 
that's the amount of money that we still have set aside from the bond that we issued to, to make that happen. Um, but we really believe that we can deliver a reasonable project by bidding probably in February of 2019. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody understood where we were at on that. Uh, the last item I would bring up is uh, the town hall budget meetings. Um, we've got the schedules um, for all the districts except for, for District 1. Um, one of the questions that I would ask, I'll just review what I have so far to make sure that that's correct. Uh, District 2 and 3 are, gonna, are going to plan to do one together uh, at the community center on September 10th. Um, District 4 is going to be a fire hall one on September 4th, and District 5 will be a Birch Grove school on September 5th. Now, at this point in time, <laughs> all the meetings are scheduled to start at a different time. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Of, no, we're individual, aren't we? For the, for the purpose of clarity and messaging, I'm asking if, if we want to be consistent in the time, mm -hmm. or if you're if 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 you're you made those choices. Uh, for a particular reason. We have one starting at 5, one starting at 6, and one starting at 6.30. I believe last year we started all of them at 6 o'clock. Sounds good. Let's go to 6 o'clock. Yeah, I, I was thinking about working people <laughs> driving to the West End, you yep. know, making it a half hour later. That was the only reason. But Let's go to 6. Good, thank you. you do six? I didn't pick the time. I said, what do you think? Mm. 6.00. I'm pretty sure they were all at six o'clock last year, and if they're consistent, then we can. Then, then the messaging um, for these budget meetings is, is simply <coughs> these different locations. All meetings start at six o'clock. It becomes a very simple message. Yeah. People don't get confused about what time to show up in which district. Good idea. So if that's okay, I'll change them all to six o'clock. Um, uh, speaking of showing up in which district and combined meetings, District 4, Mid Trail Hall. That doesn't mean that you can't come to town and do the two and three, one together. You don't have to drive up the trail if you don't want to, but you should because there's great restaurants up there if you're hungry, right before you come to the meeting. Uh, Madam Chair, that was all I had, unless there are questions. Okay. <clears throat> That's great. So what dates do you get? Um, the 4th, the 5th, and the 10th. Yeah. The 4th is... The fourth is the Tuesday after. The fourth is, is District Four. Okay. Four four. Four four. Okay. The fifth That's is handy. District Five. Five five. Wow. Wow. Jeez. Wow. <laughs> Did that happen intentionally? And District Two and Three is the tenth. So it, yeah. we had always planned to do these between today and the fifteenth of September. From the practical scheduling standpoint, we've got uh, the policy. The AMC policy conference is the twelfth, thirteenth, fourteenth. And to get the materials out, we last year we did it on the same schedule. We had all the meetings within between Labor Day and the policy conference. Okay, so we'll do District One on the sixth. Okay. Okay. At Holman. Okay. On September first. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Oh, one on one. <laughs> okay. Uh, September 6th in the downtown hall. The 6th at 6. 6th at 6. <clears throat> Very good. Okay. Great. Commissioner concerns, reports, updates, notes. So I will do an update with Soil and Water, and I hopefully do this with you every month. Elena and I kind of talked about. Um, making sure that you all know what's going on with soil and water because there are a lot of things moving and I don't know if any of you heard or not. Uh, we did renew the contract with Michaela. She was originally hired as part of a grant funding and just so you know in soil and water, everybody's on a grant fund cycle. The levy portion for them is less than 35,000 a year. So that staff in there couldn't operate without funding their own jobs by finding grants and funding to fund their jobs, if that all makes sense. And so we do have resources and funding and grants that will keep Michaela. So she is permanent until she isn't, which is if we run out of grant funding for her. And she's aware of that. Word permanent. So I don't know if she's more nervous or not before she knew for sure she had two years, and now she's on a case-by-case -case basis. So the things that we have completed in Soil and Water, there will be a lot of grants and funding that will be closed out and cleared this year. There are community 
partner shoreline projects that will be done. The Poplar River watershed will be done. Our meeting was the first week of this month, so it might be done at this point. Reservation River, Moose Mystery, and then there's a capacity grant for Lake Superior monitoring. If, if you're not aware, our soil and water does a lot of the lake monitoring and works with the volunteers on that. So that's being done. The Envirothon goes through that. The community outreach and education take a kid fishing goes through our soil and water offices. They do newspaper inserts. They just completed a shoreline brochure. So if you get a chance, since we're closer, swing in that office and get a copy. It's a beautiful two page. Um, there's more youth outreach on the watershed and then the Grammary stormwater and village ditch project. Soil and water is working with the city on that an erosion hazard map. And then um, just a lot of education outreach and we do uh, WTIP updates regularly. Someone from the board goes in and does that. And then they do an annual tree sale, wetland conservation, uh, offer technical assistance on a lot of projects. And then they worked <coughs> with, the, with Tim on the buffer law. So we will try to keep you updated since we only see Elena. She does an update approximately annually. But I talked about how during commissioner concerns, a lot of times I don't have a lot to say or update. Mm -hmm. And I think this is an opportunity for the committees that we sit on Good to idea. let you all know and let the public know what's going mm -hmm. on. And there is a lot of stuff that goes on in that soil and water office. So they are very busy folks in there. So if you get a chance, pop your head in and say thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Bobby? Well, when Arvis was talking this morning, I don't know where the info comes from. I'm a little confused on the, the golf course thing. I think it's on the golf course. It's the and, uh, yeah. I think the three employees is the Gunflint Hills golf course. Yeah. Yeah. Because but the, gun, the gun golf course mergers, whatever she was talking about. That. I don't know where that's coming from. Because that's the first I heard of that. But then I had some concerns from some other people about um, <clears throat> there seems to be a seriously lack of child care in the county. You know, people just cannot find it. I've even hit the um, Business North um, a magazine or a newspaper um, this month. Um, yeah. So it's not just Cook County, but it's a serious, serious yeah. issue. But it's it shrunk like about 50 by 50% 50 in the last few months. How many did we lose in? Memory, if we lost land, right? No, it's dramatic. And there is someone new in the community that's looking to open a daycare, so it's it's ever adjusting and fluctuating and constantly moving. Mm -hmm. I could maybe comment. Um, we didn't meet this month, but we're meeting next month, and we have we're continuing the childhood coalition. Uh, monthly meetings and it's the child care providers that are home providers as well as the Y and uh, we have some county people involved uh, from Public Health and Human Services. I'm volunteering to be on it. It's not one of my assignments and, and uh, as well as uh, the school has taken some leadership on this but yeah it, it, is, it is an issue. I know a couple of them came up with um, uh, the Lynn Shields closing, and uh, I've talked to Emily Marshall at, at Y there, and we're trying to get some of those into the Y program, even though it's a little difficult because of our, you know, you have to have so many in so many places to make it cost effective, and we're trying to fit some of those in. Uh, but yeah, it's an ongoing issue. We got ahead of the game a little bit when we opened it up at the Y, and uh, so now we're a site, which is, means we have more flexibility in the future. But funding is still an issue, and, and, and the big issue that I think we're having is we still have some uh, <coughs> families there that can't afford, uh, you know, child care, and, but they have to have child care to get a job. Mm -hmm. And that's a requirement that most of the, them up there. So it's a conundrum. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I think the efforts that uh, we're looking at is some foundations are, are willing to, to help us and with that issue, but we have to look at a sustainable model, so they're just not going to fund something forever. 
So that's that's a real trick. How do we how do we go forward? I know I'd worked a lot with this a couple of years ago and getting it going into Y and and had met with the chamber and so forth. And I think you know we're we're committed. I think we have the capability that we just we're small enough and we got to look at the resources. I think uh, to address your concern, Bobby, that uh, we we shouldn't have any young family or child uh, that needs to be in child care or wants to be in child care. Uh, we just got to figure out how to, how to fund that. And so I'll put out a plea that if anyone has any ideas, anyone who wants to support that, that uh, we should do it. Because we have, I can't remember the last number, we're down on our wait list now, but at one time the wait list was over 30. And, and, and now they're having this issue in other counties, so it's, it's I'm on some boards all over the, uh, the area, and it's been a concern all over the Northeast Minnesota as well as all over the state. The state has, to some extent, uh, part of the issue is the requirements from the state, uh, and there was some easing on restrictions, but then we had the big case in the cities where uh, someone was abusing and, and making money off of uh, the system, so it's at the state level, it's, it's sort of a mixed thing. We, I don't know if we're going to get any help from the legislature because they're saying we don't want to fund this because of you know, some problems with it. And at least that's the legislature. But um, So I, I just thought I'd share that. Um, <coughs> I think for Cook County, I, I, I'm optimistic that I think we can figure this out. It's just going to take us some time and it's going to take some collaboration and cooperation. And, and uh, I think, you know, we as a county, uh, I say that it's to our benefit sometimes to deal with these things as well. It's the whole idea of people going off the cliff and child care is an issue. So I think, I hope we can take that on and, and deal with it. Um, and the comment. Right. Thank you. Anything else? Yes, Commissioner Duker. You know, with Bobby's questions, um, <coughs> covers a lot of areas, and we have not had a meeting with our partners that we used to do on a regular basis. And I would really like us to bring our partners in if we have been sitting down with the city and the hospital and the school. <coughs> we might be on top of the game, maybe not, I don't know, but I mean. We know more. <laughs> well, yeah, like find out where they're at with the golf course and what's going on with the child care, if the school's having any issues, so I don't know who's responsible for that, but. Who coordinates it? We don't know. It's been whoever the party is that's a turn is mm -hmm. supposed to be doing it, but you know, I've sat down and talked to the mayor a couple of times, yeah, yeah, I'll put it together, we should really do this, and we just. It's put on the I think we should make it a priority. We should try to do it this fall. Okay. Make a note. Anything else? I do have um, a meeting on Monday in Duluth, and it's also the Aquatic Invasive Species meeting. And I looked on our to-do list, and I'm, I'm the alternate. <laughs> and so I don't know how that happened. I, well, I filled in for Frank. So I guess I just kind of said, okay, I'll do it. But I cannot be there on Monday from 1 to 3 here. So if anyone would be so interested in finding out about our aquatic invasives. Who's the primary? <clears throat> There's no primary. You're in the primary? Or I'm primary and the alternate. <coughs> Well, thanks, Jamie, for being two people. <laughs> so one time I can't make it. Otherwise, I've always been able to go. And it's here on Monday from 1 to 3. If anyone wants to go to the AEO meeting on Wednesday, it's in Virginia at 1 o'clock. I can't be two places at 1. i got to be in Duluth. Who's your alternate? I think it's Jenny or Jan. Oh, we should look at the alternatives. That is a fairly large board, so yeah. the quorum, except one time I had to go because I had to be the quorum. Uh, but I have not been going to all of them because I've been doubling up uh, with other, I'm, I'm just having the same day in different cities. What time is it on Wednesday? Uh, noon, I believe. Mm -hmm.
should look at who the alternate is because a lot of times yeah. you can't vote if you're not listed yeah. as the. See who the alternate is. I might be able to work it out since I'm already in the loop. Oh, okay. Oh, so I can cover the aquatic one on Monday for you, Janine, since there's no one listed. Okay, thank you. I'll put that to you. Yeah, let me know. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry, I can't remember. I think it's either Jan or Jenny. <coughs> I can look at that too. you. Me. Okay. <laughs> All righty. So before we end our meeting, we have some anniversaries that Sweet Heidi wants to acknowledge. A very little amount of them, but they're still wonderful. So we have Wes Higgins at our highway department. He hit his five-year anniversary. In Molly's office, we have Diana Mitchell, one year. In the Highway Department Maintenance 2 position, Michael Kinderman. Upstairs in Public Health, we have Grace Richard, 11 years. And then Lisa was in our Assessor's Office for a year, and she's now been our Parks and Trails for two years, so we have a total of three years with Lisa. And it's good that that's on there, because when I was thanking our Assessor's Office for all their work, I forgot about Lisa, so I have to doubly thank Lisa, because I forgot about her at one point, so I'm sorry, Lisa. Okay, thank you for your service. <clears throat> okay, if there's nothing else, uh, we will have a motion to adjourn. We are adjourned. Oh, okay, thank you. Molly, do you have a minute?